everybody. Today we're debating intelligent design and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate, as this is going to be a fun one, folks. It's going to be great. Want to let you know, if it's your first time here and you love debates, well, consider hitting that subscribe button, as you've got a lot more debates coming up. So, for example, you'll see at the bottom right of your screen, we are very excited for Joel Patrick, friend of Caitlin Bennett, if you uh, have heard of either of them. Joel Patrick will be taking on Hunter Avalone, and that will be on the Bible, homosexuality, and the transgender topic. So that's going to be a wild one, folks. We are very excited for it. Hopefully we'll see you there. And also want to let you know we're a nonpartisan platform. So we never, as Modern Day Debate, push any particular view. We try to moderate our best, at least, as fairly and as neutral as we possibly can. So with that, we do want to let you know whether you be Christian, atheist, Democrat, Republican, you name it, no matter what walk of life you're coming from, we hope you feel welcome here. And with that, we are going to jump into this debate. I want to let you know the format up front. First, it's going to be roughly 10 minute flexible opening statements from each speaker, followed by open discussion. Then we'll have Q&A. So if you have a question, fire it into the old live chat. If you tag me with an at modern day debate, that makes it easier for me to get every single question. So I can't guarantee we'll get to read every question, but I can at least put every question in the list. And if you happen to, you can also have the option to do Super Chat. So Super Chat will push your question to the top of the list during the Q&A, and it also gives you the possibility of giving, you could say, a statement toward one of the speakers to which they would get a chance to respond to, of course. And we ask, with all of the questions or Super Chats, whatever it is, you be your regular friendly selves. So with that, thanks so much, folks. Also... Do want to say, Cat Earth, thanks for joining our Patreon. Really appreciate the support and that you are totally, uh, we appreciate you said you, you support the message of the kind of neutral platform. So that's really encouraging. And with that, G-Man will be going first. So before I uh, do set G-Man loose, let him out of his cage. Uh, he is ready to go. He's excited. Uh, and then... Following that, we'll, we'll let Erica out of her cage. It's going to be a lot of fun, folks. I do want to say thanks so much to both G-Man and Erica for being here tonight. It's a pleasure to have you both. Glad to be here. Be here, yeah. You yeah, bet. The floor is all yours, G-Man. All right. Uh, quick confession to the audience real quick. I already let Erica know this, and I let uh, Modern Day Debate know this. That would be Mr. James. That, um, unfortunately, the dog ate my notes. So... Today, I'm going to agree to do something that I don't necessarily like to do, and I'm going to go full G-Man today. Well, you're viewing entertainment because I don't have any notes for this debate. However, I've debated this enough times to, to have an idea where all of this is going to go. All right. And guess what, guys? I came up with a presentation. Don't laugh at me. My very first one doing this in the debate. So let's get to it. All right. By the way, quick shout out to all of you Christians uh, uh, and evolutionists that are out there. Cool. So let's do a quick screen share here, <clears throat> and uh, I'll show you my abomination of a presentation. All right, let's get started. For the for the listening audience and for Erica, I would like for you guys to do something for me. I want people to learn how to think for a minute, okay? It's not difficult. We sit back and we consider, all right? So let's just think for a moment, okay? <laughs> Back here. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, cool. So do I get that little bit of 10 seconds back or whatever? With me. Thank you. All right, thank you. Cool. So it's time to think, ladies and gentlemen. We have to sit back and we have to consider, okay? Now I know a lot of the people that are watching this are evolutionists and you're atheists, but guys, evolution and atheism is madness. I forgot what evolution I'm sorry. But it's madness. Erica always says this one thing in the opening of her statements. How you doing, my fellow apes? I know how you guys, how you, how you doing, your apes and my primate friends? We're all apes, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am not an ape. <laughs> I resent being called an ape. I know you resent being called an ape. We are not living on the planet of the apes. I am a human being, and we need to think about this. 
I am not an ape and neither are you. I am a human being, fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. We have a common design. I'm going a little bit too far. So let's get here. Okay. After we get the circle of doom going here. All right, cool. So we're not living on the planet of the apes. I don't look nothing like this. Neither does Erica. Erica looks more like a, a supermodel or whatever, not a um, not a not an ape over here. So, you know, <laughs> this, this, this is not us. This is not my relative. This is not my buddy. This is not my cousin. Let me tell you something. This is what we do with apes. We put apes in zoos. That's what we do with apes. We put them in zoos. Okay. I'm not an ape. You're not an ape. We put apes in zoos. But it was a time, ladies and gentlemen, in our history here in the United States that they did have they, they, they did have us in zoos. It was called the transatlantic slave trade. And they had a whole bunch of apes, according to evolutionists, in chains working for free without paying anybody. You understand what I'm saying? The transatlantic slave trade was the worst time for apes, I guess, right? No, we put apes in zoos. We learned uh, uh, with the abolitionists and everything that this is probably not the thing that we needed to do, right? So I think my notes would have been a lot better. But <laughs> Anyway, guys, I want to talk about intelligent design, and I want to talk about the idea that we have a common designer and we are not uh, uh, cousins or distant cousins with, like, you know, Bigfoot or, you know, the, the runaround monkey that's out there or whatnot, okay? We're all, we're all, uh, we, we all have a common designer. Again, we don't live on Planet of the Apes, all right? <clears throat> so what is intelligent design? I'll try to explain it to you this way. I want you to imagine Erica uh, looking for a fossil one day. She's out there with her big digging tools, digging in the rocks, and she finds herself a watch. I know a lot of you are like, oh, God, you man, the watchmaker. Chill, relax, just relax. You guys are going to be better than that, okay? You go out there and you find this watch, and you're like, wow, I wonder what this evolved from. Well, actually, if we think a little bit, you know what I mean? We consider what we have in our hands with this watch, right? Circle of doom here. Circle of doom go away. We have this watch here. We open up this watch and we examine it and we do some science on it. We start looking at all of these components and motors and little gears inside this little thing. And, and we start noticing that there's some copper in there, there's some aluminum in there, there's some platinum in there, you know, in this Rolex. You know, we're like, what kind of metals would evolve over a long period of time for us to get a watch? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that would be pretty difficult to do, right? Um, but if we actually think a little bit and use a little bit of common sense and really just, just put our mind behind it, I think we'll come up with the right conclusion regarding this watch, that it didn't evolve over a long period of time, that, you know, that watch was designed by a watchmaker. Gee, man, we, we killed that argument a million times. The watchmaker argument doesn't prove you're a god, yada, 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 yada. Fine. The fact of the matter is, none of you are going to refute that that watch has a watchmaker. All of you already agree with me with that. Great. What if you went to a beach and you saw a bunch of rocks like this? How did those rocks get there? Did the ocean perhaps uh, keep, keep, keep hitting the ocean ground? Or perhaps that a human being, somebody with an intelligence, actually start piling up rocks themselves? It doesn't take a lot of uh, common sense, ladies and gentlemen, to come to this conclusion. But there's other examples here, too, that I want to show you guys. Again, I wish I had my notes. Um, Erica is good, later on is probably going to be telling you guys that over a long period of time, all of these animals shared a common ancestor, right? And that these animals learned how to survive based on their environment. One of the things that I'm going to be very interested in hearing Erica talk about, and perhaps even because I know she has a fascination with spiders and frogs, I think they are, Erica. If I'm not mistaken, you had a frog and a spider video. I want to know why black widows eat their mates after they, like, you know, procreate and everything. That, 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 we don't talk about the morality of that. We don't talk about, like, the evolution of that. I, I really want to know why these black widows eat their mates. Maybe they were designed to do that for a particular reason. Perhaps you can actually explain to me what happened a million years ago with these black widow spiders. Show me some real proof of it, and then we can talk about it. Anyway, let's continue here. So that's one of my problems with, uh, with, with, with evolution. And something else that I've, I've talked about on, uh, on various different occasions on GTV, on my science channel, if you want to call it that, <laughs> is an elephant. When these elephants are born, no, how do they learn how to walk? Why is it when the, that the day they're born, they can instinctively know how to walk? I want to know this. I want to understand this. I want somebody to explain to me over a long period of time how these elephants learned how to just walk without nobody teaching them these things. 
I think there's something that needs to be uh, there's something that needs to be spoken about. I believe that these elephants were designed to be able to walk for survival reasons. All right, let's continue. And other reasons as well. You know, we're not humans and elephants are not related, and we're very different. Another thing I learned about horses is that one hour after a horse is born, that horse is able to walk. Very interesting. Let's continue. And by the way, for those of you who are watching this, again, I told you I was going to go full G-Man, and it's going to get better as we go on, okay? Again, horses can walk one, app, one hour after it's born. Now, if that's not technically right, that's fine. Now, when our parents have us, we ain't walking right away. It usually takes, what, six months to a year for us to start walking. You know, first we start crawling. Some of us crawl backwards because, you know, because our coordination's off. You know what I mean? But, but babies, babies can't walk right away. Why is it that? Why? How can a horse do this and a baby can't? It takes a full year after our parents teach us and strengthen our legs for us to be able to walk. If you go to LiveScience.com, uh, found something really interesting over there. That pound for pound, a chimp is stronger than a human. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how many times have we been in these uh, hangouts and in these conversations with these evolutionists where they have told us that things get better over time, right? Now, this, now Erica loves chimps. She loves monkeys. She loves apes. She loves everything about them. She says that in her opening statements all the time. What I find very interesting about this is if everything is better over time, one of the things I like to know is why am I weaker than a chimp or a gorilla or a or, or, or a monkey or a, uh, an orangutan or anything like that. Why am I weaker than them? If evolution is true, then I should be stronger to adapt into my environment. No, evolution for some reason decided that, that I needed to be weaker uh, uh, moving on or whatever. So anyway, let me continue. Again, guys, I lost my notes. Don't whack at me, all right? So again, if you go to, uh, to, uh, to liveaction.com, this is what it's going to tell you, okay? And, and again, it goes into pound for pound, our closest cousins it, uh, in the animal kingdom are about 1.35 uh, times more powerful than humans, according to the first study compare to the underlying biology and mechanics of chimpanzees muscles to human muscle along the reviewing previous research done on the topic. Again, I'm not understanding how evolution chose us to be weaker and not stronger. Then the evolutionists love when we bring this kind of thing up, you know, we're designed, and what about all the human errors? Now you guys are about to get your laugh on. I don't know if Erica's going to talk about this or not, but you know, some of you guys out there who are real sick want to know why we, why men got nipples. You know, one of the things that I want to tell you about this particular topic is, is when God created our skin, I guess it had to end somewhere, if you know what I mean. So, <laughs> so again, you know, um, that's one of the questions that you guys like to ask regarding, why do we have so many mistakes? It's not a mistake. All right. Uh, why are there different races? So, so there are evolutionists that's actually asking why there are different races. My friends, there is only one human race, all right? I take the position that in the book of Genesis, I'm going to say this now so I ain't got to say it later, that in the book of Genesis, uh, uh, God told, Israel, told, the people, uh, uh, told man to go out and to be fruitful and to multiply. And what they ended up doing was they, did, they created a tower that was going to reach God and God confounded the languages and he went to different parts of the earth. Whether you believe that story or not, you, we, and we both believe that at one time everybody was in one particular area and then we spread out, okay? Some of our pigmentation changed. Some of our skin color changed and, and, and our anatomy changed a little bit. Uh, uh, but it doesn't mean that, that, that we are, that, that we're a different race. We're the same people. We just look a little different, all right? I love what Ken Hogan says. There's no black and you never seen a black person, you never seen a white person. What you see is humans. That's what you see. All right. Now, if we go to Darwin <laughs> and we look at this origin of species, they're the ones who so focus on this stuff. The origin of species by means of natural selection. Uh I'm sorry, what happened? Okay, the preservation of favorite races. Okay, I'm gonna have to fast forward this a little bit. Erica, can I get about three more minutes, Erica? Because I really didn't have my notes. Is it all right? Hey. It's cool with me. If it's cool, James. All right, cool. Yeah, James, let me get my three minutes, man, please. I'll just try to keep going on. So it's, it's, it's these Darwinian, this, ladies and gentlemen, that is focused on race. Watch this. And I'm not the only person that's skeptical about evolution, ladies and gentlemen. Not at all. 
suggest it because mm -hmm. of claims for the ability of random mutations. And natural selection. To account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. <laughs> Skeptical, 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 skeptical of claims for the ability for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Should be encouraged. No, I do want to say I include this all the trolls that are watching this here today because a lot of you are going to sit there and tell me that it's just G-Man. G-Man is the only person that disagrees with the theory of evolution. And no, it's not only G-Man. There's a whole lot of scientists that back me up on this too where we're skeptical about the theory of evolution and the complexity that is involved. So I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm, I'm going to yield my time here. This is just my opening statement without my notes. I know I butchered the entire thing. It'll get better when we, as we go into the Q&A. Bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, we have evidence. Evidence. We have proof because we see it every day. That, that, that we share a common ancestor with other human beings, okay? We do not share a common ancestor with a monkey, an ape, a gorilla, a watermelon, grapes, dates, raisins, or anything like that, because we have no evidence for that. We've never seen it. There's no, there's no observation on it whatsoever, and there's no experimentation that can use to prove it. I yield my time. Erica, I would love to hear your presentation. Uh, thank you. Oh, really. I, okay. <laughs> go ahead, Erica. Wow, man. That, that was full G-man, wasn't it? I'm not quite sure, you know, honestly, I, I, I just, I, I might as well just yield my, my whole statement in the rest of the debate. G-Man already won. That's, that's what everyone's saying. Oh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess it just wasn't that funny. <laughs> All right, James, am I good to share my screen? What do you think? Okay, cool. Hold on. Let me see if I can actually get this going. Oh, wait, hold on. I don't think I can share it once I've got the, if I don't have it up already. Well, maybe. I liked the video, G-Man. I was a big fan of that. Okay, cool, cool. All right, let's see here. Share screen. All right, can you guys see that? Yeah, there we go. All right. Good to go? Yes. Very cool. All right, I'm going to set this to... Let me make sure this still works. Yeah, good to go? Great, okay, I'm gonna start now. All right, my presentation is titled Intelligent Design and Why It Is Inferior to Evolution in Every Conceivable Way. This is, of course, by me, Erica, your, your gentle and modern primate, speaking to the rest of you gentle modern apes out there. And uh, this is actually a picture of myself and a couple of my colleagues in 2015 uh, recreating the March of Progress, which is that famous, uh, albeit slightly inaccurate, classic evolution photo in Old Divide Gorge in Tanzania, which is actually where they find a great many uh, hominin specimens. But let's go ahead and start. So what are we discussing today? Well, what we are discussing is intelligent design in its young earth creationist context and in its viability in explaining the biodiversity of life on earth when compared to evolutionary theory. What we're not discussing is the Big Bang, the formation of stellar bodies, abiogenesis, analogs to various non-biological entities such as cars and computer code, outdated literature from 1980 and before, and quotes from specific scientists without full context. So, what is intelligent design? Let's define it. Well, generally speaking, it's the theory that life or the universe uh, cannot have arrived by chance and it was designed or created by some intelligent entity. But in a young earth creationist context, which is what, what G-Men would be based off of my cursory analysis of him, it's that living, organis living organisms rather are created more or less in their present form by an intelligent designer. And this is intelligent, like ID proponents are almost exclusively linked to those who hold uh, religious beliefs, which I find very interesting because if we're following the evidence where it leads, you'd think that there would be some crossover between sort of the, the, uh, the conventional scientists that maybe don't have religious beliefs. So the general arguments from intelligent design are the fine tuning argument. This would fall into that category of the first group of people, which is the idea that Earth's conditions, both cosmic and local, seem kind of designed for life as they might be rare. 
Now, this isn't really relevant to today, uh, and I would suggest the G-men confront uh, an astronomer or physicist with those ones. But the other one is irreducible complexity. And this is the idea that there are things in nature which are so complex that they could not have possibly evolved by natural processes alone. This is very relevant. So here's some of the classic irreducible complexity arguments is where I thought G-men was going today. The evolution of the eye, the heart, the flagella, multicellularity, terrestrial living invertebrates, wings and birds, and consciousness, which of course, is in, of course is in quotation marks because consciousness is kind of hard to define. So I thought I'd go ahead and zip through a couple of these really quickly. Because generally speaking, when creationists or ID proponents are talking about the how, wow, it's just confounding, we have no idea how the, the heart or the eye or multicellularity could have evolved, this is not the case. And, and more often than not, it seems to be the case that, that very little or no research has been done on the literature base with regard to, to kind of observations and experimentation that has been done regarding the evolution of such structures or mechanisms. So the eye and the heart, wow, look at this. We've got two very recent papers, one from 2013 and one from 2017, which sort of denote how we, how we track this evolution, both in fossil specimens, in genetics, and of course in living organisms, because many of these steps have living analogs. What about the flagellum? Well, there's a great paper from, uh, let's see, 2007, which is a little older than I would like, but I really liked this, this sort of summary here. These results show that the core components of the bacterial flagellum originated through the successive duplication and modification of a few, or perhaps even a single precursor gene. This quote alone blows out of the water this whole concept of, oh, well, you need new information. Because as conventional science has been saying the entire time, new information is very frequently not known novel. It's a repetition and change of old information, an adaption on an existing structure. What about terrestrial living in tetrapods? Well, G-Men loves saying that there's no transitional species, no transitional fossils. I would love to talk about that with him if we get the chance, because here are some good ones right here. Eustonopteron, Pandorichthys, Tiktaalik. We have uh, Acanthostega and um, Ichthyostega. And what we can see in these fossils, which are separated by geologic time, is a mosaic of traits that's slowly moving in its ratio from being more fish-like, or rather more sarcopterygian-like, to being more tetrapod-like. This includes the emergence of digits, bones in the forearms, pectoral muscles for lifting themselves up, and, and all sorts of this good stuff, including eyes moving uh, to the tops of the head, and indeed lung structures, sometimes combined with gill structures and our more mosaic specimens. What about wing evolution? Well, we got that too. In fact, we see the emergence of, of feathers just being sort of a plumage statement to being full on uh, flight capable in Rahanavis and Archaeopteryx change through geologic time. I, I don't think if you ran into any of these earlier guys towards the left of the screen in person that you would think they were anything but a dinosaur, but the fact of the matter is you would be right because birds are dinosaurs. They're theropods. Consciousness. Now this is one I really like because I, as g probably knows, I study primates or I'm in the process of studying primates. The theory of mind and language are both tied very tightly to consciousness. And here is just a series of various papers that I've had to read this semester regarding uh, primates and their, their very, very likely theory of mind, the emergence of language and it's very proto form in animals as basal as geladas, as well as sort of a theory of mind that we see in cetaceans, in corvids and in cephalopods. So, you know, <laughs> Very interesting stuff. We even see at the bottom one, that's a great paper. Gestural repertoire of one to two year old children mimics what we see in chimps, which is very interesting. In short, intelligent design is not necessary. Every appeal to intelligent design can, and for the most part has been shown to be a likely product of evolution by natural selection. No organism or mechanism found in nature can be evaluated as impossible to have occurred thanks to evolution because impossible necessitates preclusion. This means you essentially have to say, well, there's no way it could have happened, and I don't think that has ever been done. Additionally, thanks in part to the Wedge document, we now know that modern intelligent design is unapologetically an attempt to offer an alternative to evolution, which requires religion, not evolution. It's an alternative that does require religion. So other flaws for intelligent design. Well, from a YAC perspective, it cannot de denote its own created kinds. It also has to grapple with the overwhelming evidence of an ancient earth and universe from geology and physics. Intelligent design cannot clarify what makes a design a design. There's no way to tell what is or what isn't a part of design or an emergence from a created kind. And most importantly, intelligent design lacks any semblance of a model or testable predictions and relies almost entirely on attempting to poke holes in evolution. As such, it has an abysmal 
literature base. Like it's very difficult to find anybody, uh, anybody serious talking about intelligent design, except for maybe Stephen Meyer and Michael Behe. What about evolutionary theory? Well, common descent or an evolutionary theory is supported by geology, paleontology, genetics, uh, morphology, and statistics. It is by far and away the most parsimonious answer to the question of biodiversity. So let's zip through some of this. Genetics, humans and chimpanzees, when we compare coding base pairs, are about 99% similar. And you guys are going to see a lot of these slides that if you follow my debates at all that you've seen before, because I, I have to bring them up again. We have three papers at the bottom left that, that you know, support this. In fact, humans are more closely related to the chimps and bonobos than any other animal, and they are more closely related to us than any other animal. This is important. That means a chimpanzee has more in common with you genetically and with me genetically than they do with a gorilla. And of course, you, we determined that with the same method, sort of a souped up version, albeit, that we used to determine paternity in humans. Um, that's relatedness. So where do we draw the line? That's the classic question. Here are a couple of great papers on uh, endogenous retroviruses, which are, you know, they essentially necessitate being passed down from common ancestors, and 99.9 .9 of the ERVs we find in humans are shared with those in the chimp genome. What about paleontology? Wow, I love this picture. I bring it up every time because I think it's so cool. Here we have a ton of different hominid and hominin skulls all lined up in a row. And what we see is small morphologic change over geologic time. It may be hard to imagine B going to C or, or rather not B to C. It might be hard to imagine B going to M, but not quite difficult to imagine B to C. In fact, some anthropologists who are trained have trouble identifying who's who. That's how gradual this change is. Of course, it does require quite a bit of time, and I hope that we will discuss that as well. Here's some excellent uh, sort of uh, in-depth look at the Australopithecines, both Afarensis, Anamensis, and Afarensis, or rather Africanus. So we have almost identical knees in the bottom right. It's important to remember we don't just have one specimen of Australopithecines, we have many. They have a parabolic palate, a, a gradually more medial um, ventral foramen magnum going underneath the skull to support bipedalism. An inline big toe. Look at these pelvises. If you were to pick one that was the odd man out, you'd pick the chimp. What about the femoral head? Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy how, how gradual this is. You couldn't ask for a more perfect mosaic with regard to postcranium. What about morphology? Well, everything that you use to categorize that rhesus macaque as a catarine, you used to put humans in the same category. We have all of the same traits that make them catarines, and that's why we are also classified as catarines. We could go in depth more onto this, but, uh, you know, we, we'd, we'd be here all day if we spent all that time doing it. What about statistics? This is, this is sort of a recent one that I very much like, and I appreciate uh, Jackson Wheat for these sources. I'm going to read sort of these little quotes from these two papers, both of which are very recent. The first one says, we overwhelmingly reject both species and family separate ancestry. Those are the created kind sort of in a creation order that answers in Genesis proposes due to infinitesimal p-values. Many of these data sets reject species separate ancestry strongly and the probability of obtaining a test statistic more extreme than the one observed under the species separate ancestry model being incredibly small, often approaching or greatly exceeding the probability of picking a correct atom at random among the estimated 10 to the 80th atoms in the known universe. That means that statistically speaking, when we just look at the raw mathematic data, there is no support for separate ancestry. Then there's the second one that says, we demonstrate quantitatively that as predicted by evolutionary theory, sequences of homologous proteins from different species converge as we go further and further back in time. A non-evolutionary model shows no, con or a non-evolutionary control model shows no convergence and only a small number of parameters are required to account for the observation. It is time that researchers insisted that doubters put up testable alternatives to evolution, which they have not. Well, what about you weren't there? You know, it's not like we, we saw all this happen, but that, and that's true. But there are plenty of fields of science that are not as scrutinized as evolution that do the same thing. In astronomy, we get data from neutron stars and black holes and supernovae, and they inform us of their properties. We're not directly observing them most of the time, or in some cases, none of the time we, we are. <laughs> what about medicine? Well, a pathogen is not always directly cultured, but doctors will still treat it based off of the data or the symptoms. Or geology. We haven't watched the plates move for millions of years, but we know how they move today, and we can use that to predict the formations they were once in. Most creationists accept Pangaea under a Noachian lens, saying that all the plates moved apart into their present condition during Noah's flood. And a shameless plug for R.J. Downard and Jackson Wheat. They have an excellent book that covers in more depth what I've done in this small presentation. So to conclude, 
intelligent design in a young earth creationist model it lacks a model, it makes no predictions, it lacks any statistical power, and it fails utterly to explain biodiversity. Evolutionary theory, on the other hand, has a model that is supported by numerous fields, has made thousands upon thousands of testable predictions, has enormous statistical power, and it explains biodiversity in its entirety. And that's all I have to say. I'm, I'm excited to chat with the G-Man. Thank you very much, Erica. We will now go into the open discussion section. So, folks, with that, if you have questions, as mentioned, fire them into the old live chat, because in about an hour, we will go into the Q&A, and we are very excited for that as well. So, G-Man and Erica, pleasure to have you. The floor is all yours. G-Man, you, you kick us off. <laughs> all right, cool. So you said that intelligent design doesn't make any predictions. Yes. That's the last thing I heard you say. That's interesting. So what you're telling me is I can't predict that if your mom and your dad decide, decide to have sex, they won't have children? No, that's not intelligent design. Okay, why is that not intelligent design? Because intelligent design, in it, at least in its creationist version, based off of the, you know, the, the, site, the sources that I have found, maybe you have one that disagrees, but intelligent design by definition requires an, an external intelligent designer to, to interact and tinker with organisms that it is not part of. You see what I mean? So for it to be intelligent design, you would have to have maybe like a doctor who would intervene in sort of the, the embryology of, of that to create an organism that, that was modified. That would be intelligently designing at least aspects of that organism. But you will agree with me that the mother and the father would be intelligent, right? And they can make their minds up about having offspring, right? Absolutely. Every animal does that. Uh, that, that is at least... Um, well, I wouldn't say every, most, let's say most mammals do that and a great many bird. Okay. So I'm going to have to disagree with you there. I believe that, and again, I believe I'm a human, not an animal. All right. So I'm, I'm giggling a little bit because I'm trying to like, like, you know, take all of this in or whatever. So, uh, no, I, I, I actually believe that, um, that when two intelligent people come together and they plan to have a child or they don't plan to have a child, that there's an intelligence going on there. For them to have offspring we don't have to agree with that. that that that's fine all right but tell me this i'm sorry go ahead do you not think though that that's kind of out of left field like that has nothing to do with the traditional definition of intelligent design well there's a traditional uh definition of intelligent design and then there's what we actually believe about intelligent design a lot of us christians actually do believe that that has to do with intelligence you know, I mean, I've, I will, I will say anecdotally, I've never met a, a Christian creationist or otherwise that suggests that intelligent design includes humans uh, procreating by sort of just deciding to do so. Um, yeah, so but so. that's just me. I mean, you know, I can't, I can't argue with your experience if, if you've experienced otherwise, you know. Well, but, but you want to know what? I mean, that's what I'm finding well because I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to this point very shortly. Um, my other question for you is, is um. You are obviously an evolutionist, and you believe that we share a common ancestor with apes, right? Very. Uh, you also believe you also believe that we share a common ancestor. I'm sorry. Do you want to finish what you were saying? Or? No, I just agree with you. Okay, so you also believe we share a common ancestor with a gazelle, right? Yes. You believe that we share a common ancestor with a frog, right? Cold blooded animal. Okay. Very much. Could, could you do me a favor? Because I know you like to do the screen share thing and everything and whatnot. And I know you probably got the tree of life somewhere on your computer or something like that. Can, can you do me a, a favor and explain to me how we get new anatomical features in order for um, in order for me to, to, to prove that I'm related to these other animals? Because if you look at my DNA, you look at the DNA of a frog, we've both got two different DNAs. So I need to see the in-between work. Yes. That, that I'm to a frog. And yeah. I know you're prepared for that, but I still want to see this tree of life again, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, are you are you just, let me ask you, are you just looking for a basic picture of the tree of life? No, I would like I, I would like an explain. I would like you to show me the tree of life and then explain to me how I'm related to a frog. Because what I constantly say here on net all the time is, and a lot of these uh, and a lot of the evolutionists watching this knew I was going to say this to you. All right, uh, if you're going to say I'm related to a frog, then somewhere on my family tree, you got to be able to show me where it is and how and how you know we went from being a frog. Obviously, the small changes over a long period of time. How we went from being a frog, frog to a human. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, a frog to a very different looking frog to a very different looking frog. You don't got to go through every step, but explain it in such a way where you can show me that I'm actually related to a frog. 
across other than what you learned in school. I actually want to I actually want to hear and see how you came to the conclusion that I share a common essence with the frog, and then I'll tie it in with what I believe about intelligence. Sure. Well, I think the first thing that you have to start with, because I mean, that's you, you, we would agree that that's rather, that's a rather large question because you can come at it from a bunch of different angles. You could look at genetics and you could say, well, it's awfully convenient that the genetics that you share with the frog, like if you're just looking at coding base pairs, they seem to follow, like, let's say you took a frog, a mouse and a rhesus macaque, which is like a monkey, right? If you look at those, and let's actually, let's add an additional one on there. Let's say that you have a lungfish, a frog, right? And then you have a mouse and then you have a monkey. If you compare all your, your genomes side by side, what you would find is that you share most in common with a rhesus macaque, then a mouse, then a frog, then a lungfish. Is it not a bit coincidental that that matches up with what we find in the fossil record? For instance, the first sort of lungfish-esque organisms that we find, which would be sort of um, like your eusthenopteron, these, these kind of early uh, cercopterygians that are spending a lot of time inland. And if you look at their hands, quote unquote hands, you'll find that they're starting to get the differentiation that all of the raffin fish would have, or raffin organisms would have lacked, right? So why is it that you can time it that way? Additionally, when you do what's a, sort of a molecular clock analysis of, of your divergence from let's say members of a neura, right? So you're just your classic frog. That time also matches up with the radiometric dating for the fossils when we see that divergence in the record. These are two completely independently related means of dating things, and yet they're giving you the same result, which is that approximately sometime during the Devonian period, which would be several hundred million years ago, I believe two, 200... 30 something, maybe. I can't give you the exact number. I should know this, but I don't. Um, that, that if you go back that far in time, right, you're getting a convergence of molecular clock data, right, fossil record divergence, mm -hmm. and um, uh, sort of this lack, right, of any other organism emerging that under sort of a younger creationism lens should be there at that time. Okay. And that has nothing to do with rock dating. We can agree with that, yes? Uh, for right now, yes, good. So, so why do they match? Why do they match? You mean with the with the fossils and the rock dating? With like fossil record, right? And genetic molecular clocks, which is basically when you take a, a trait, you look at its mutation rate, and you track it backwards to try to find, or it's trait, you take a, an organism, you look at its mutation rate, and you track it backwards as far as you can, right? You can do this with very, very nice well, accuracy now. That kind of goes off a little bit of what I was asking you, though. Like, okay, so I get that you're using rocks and you're using fossils within rocks to try to determine, uh, like, how old it is and everything. Like that. but that's, not, that's not really answering my question about how I'm related to a frog, though. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I do. There, there are supposed to be changes that happens, you know, in every generation of, the, you know, the, the offspring of the frogs. Some of them will get bigger. Some of them will be mutations. Some of them will be bigger. Some of them smaller. Some of them will be more green. Some of them will be more brown or whatever. Some of them, their tongues will go longer, you know, help they adapt into the environment yeah. and everything and whatnot. But at some point, this frog has to create different features, new anatomical features, is the, uh, 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 in order for it to be something that's not a frog to get to where we are, you know, with, with, with apes. That's the only way I can be related. It has to be on my family tree. Absolutely. How does that happen? Well, if you're asking for it sort of on, on a, a genetic, on a genetic level, like how do we on see- On a genetic it? level, yes. That's what asking. So like the addition of new information. That's what yes. That's Okay, so there's this really fascinating, two actually very interesting studies on, on body plan genes. So I, I believe they're called the Hox genes, right? And then also another gene that's interestingly enough called the sonic hedgehog gene. And essentially what, these, what the researchers did is they looked at the development of the ends of limbs for fish, right? And they analyzed how you, because you know, we've seen a fish fin before. They have a lot of rays that stem out way more than five digits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It turns out if you influence the, the genes that are responsible not only for triggering that growth, but also for spreading out and creating those many rays, right? If you influence those genes, you can influence the number of digits that that has, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say, let's say you're going from, you know, a, a, thin, a fish with fins to, to a tetrapod, a frog. Mm -hmm. Well, for one, that's how you're going to get from a ray fin to, to a digit limb, right? But well, how does the DNA change into that, though? 
You know what I mean? How, how does the information create these new features? Uh, when a mutation happens, and Ken Hovind, I, I, I've heard him explain this to you before or to someone else, you know what I mean? A mutation with the extra finger, that's the same information. You know what I mean? Another eye, that's the same information. You know what I mean? Uh, another arm or whatever, or another head altogether, you know, Siamese swim or whatever, you know what I mean? That's, that's the same information. In order for me to be related to a frog, and this is something I ask on YouTube on a regular basis, I'm doing this sincerely. I, I, I need to know how these features change in order for me to take it seriously that I'm related to a frog. I've been to the Museum of Natural History. I've been there with some pretty smart people, and none of them has been able to show me how you go back far enough, even back to the cell, to be able to show me how these anatomical, they, they tell me what they think happened, what they theorize has happened, but they've never been able to prove it. And that's what I'm trying to find. Like how, how does the DNA uh, mutate to such a point where it's no longer another arm or another leg or another eye or whatever, but it becomes a totally new anatomical feature altogether? So let's look at it from this point of view. I think that this kind of exercise is a good one to explain you know, where we're coming from because creationists wow. and, and uh, those who are not creationists generally have a, a pretty different idea of what new information is. Okay. This is the example that I use. So if you, if you had um, a, a sentence, a very short sentence, and it says the cat, right? Well, what if you get a duplication event? So then it says the cat, cat, okay? Now, what if there's a mutation in that second or the first word cat, right? So mm -hmm. change that letter C to a letter, let, or rather the second one, rather the S. I was correct the first time. The second word cat. In the letter C, right. you get an S. So then you have the cat sat. Right. Let's say there's another mutation that duplicates sat. So now you have the cat sat sat. And then let's say there's another mutation that changes that D in the first word sat to, or the T from the, in the first word sat to a D. So now You're you have- about the code in the DNA, right? And how it's different, right? Okay. So now you have the sentence, the sad cat sat. Okay. You get what I'm saying? Now, yes. more information conveyed in the sentence, the sad cat sat, than in the word, or in the sentence, the cat. Right. So that's what we're dealing with here. Duplication events compounded by, by just even single base pair mutations, or sometimes entire segments, can give you vastly different anatomical features, not just in how, in, in how it's sort of uh, uh, transcribed in, in the genes itself, but even in how it's expressed. You see okay. what Okay. So there's a myriad of different possibilities in just a sentence as small as the cat, right? Mm -hmm. Because how many three-letter words do we know? Right. You know what I mean? But the so point of the matter is, though, what we actually observe every day is, again, if a frog has a certain type of leg and, it, and, and it's experiencing mutation, it's going to have the same type of leg, it's going to have the same type of eye, the same type of whatever. We don't see this new feature where we're seeing it turning into a different type of I ain't gonna say a, a different type of species, but a different kind. You know what so, I mean? Because in order for me to be related to a cold like an animal, you have to have that. And I don't see evolution as doing that. And it goes back to what I said in my presentation, that that's an argument for intelligent design, that God intentionally designed. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ken Hovind teaches us it like this. You got, the, you got the dog kind, you got the cat kind, you got the, the bird kind, you know what I mean? If the bird is constantly evolving, and yes, I do believe in microevolution or variations within the kinds. I believe that you can have a, a parrot that will give offspring and that parrot will look slightly different than its parents. And those parrots will have offspring and they'll look slightly different from their parents, but they're still the parrots. In order for me to be on that family tree, we have to see these new anatomical changes in order for me to be related. If I don't see them, I believe that, I'm, I believe that there's reasons to doubt Darwinian evolution and so, not accept it and intelligent design rules at that particular point. So there, there are a couple things to kind of take apart with that. One, if you'll yeah. remember from my presentation, I covered quite a few kind of segments of irreducible complexity and one of them was the flagellum. So when you say things like adding new information, um, how do you get from a leg to a wing, for instance, uh, which appears to be, wow, quite, quite a difficult situation. Um, but when you look at the flagellum, right, they actually, they, if I remember the paper correctly, they took about 51 bacteria, right, of varying stages of flagella. You know what I mean when I say flagella? Like the little tail that comes off of the end right, of, right. of the bacteria or whatever microorganism. Okay. Um, and they looked at a bunch of different stages. And they realized that when they map the genome for the flagella, what they actually find is that every single kind of flagella is just an alteration of, of a precursor flagella, which means you can track it backwards through their genome. And when they did that, what they found out, which you know, it's a very short paragraph, so I'll just reread it, that the results show that the core components of the bacterial flagellum originated through a successive duplication, so that's your cat-cat, 
Mm -hmm. uh, modification of a few, or perhaps even a single precursor gene. So the point of the matter is that there isn't a single trait in the entire animal kingdom, except perhaps the movement from uh, uh, single cellular organisms to multicellularity uh, that is novel. Every other kind is just a, it's, it's an alteration of a previously existing structure through genetics or genetic expression. Okay. Now to add on to that, when you say a kind, right? I'm gonna ask you a question. Okay. Is house cat the same kind as a tiger? I'm sorry, say that again? In your opinion, is a house cat the same kind of animal in, in the biblical sense as a tiger? Um, I look at it as, I look at uh, cats and, and the tigers being feline. You know, uh, I think it's possible that you, if, if all you did was use tigers and you have them give offsprings and you did selective, um, what, what is it, selective, uh, selective breeding, you know what I mean? It's possible that you get something that small and it could be a house cat. I don't have an issue with that, but that still would fall under micro, micro evolution and not macro. When we get to the macro level, that's when you start making the argument that human beings can be related to these different animals. And I, I just don't see that. Right, but that's, you know not, I mean? I, that's not the point I'm trying to make. If you think, and, and I'm getting the idea that, that you do, if you don't, you can correct me. But if okay. you think that uh, a, a house cat and a tiger, as many creationists can and do, uh, would, would kind of agree with you that they are the same kind because they're both felids, right? Um, well, then you run into something of a, of a difficult snafu because house cats and, and Bengal tigers- I don't believe that, by the way. I'm just letting you know that though. Oh, you don't, you don't think they're the it's same- possible, It's possible that the creator could have made house cats. I'm just telling you, I wouldn't have a problem if it turned out that we can take tigers or lions or whatever, and we can do selective breeding and we can make, and we can, I don't know, after like maybe a thousand years or whatever, get house cats or whatever. And we have an issue with that because they're both felines. The so, issue I'm having with this conversation and, 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 with, and with this debate with evolution, it's not just you, this is with the audience too, it's with evolutionists, evolutionists in general. In order for me to be related to a cat, there has to be new anatomical features. You can no longer be a feline no more. You can get smaller. You can get bigger. You can be as big as a dinosaur. I don't have an issue with that. You're still a cat. At some point, you, the, 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 the science has got to be able to show how the DNA is mutated in such a way when, you're no, when it's no longer a cat no more. You, you understand? Mm -hmm. Or I can't be in that family tree. Yes, I'm with you and we'll get to that. And I would love to get to that in just a second, but I, I kind of want to make this point here. Yeah. Let me put it a different way. Do you think that cats and tigers share a common ancestor in, in the form of some kind of basal created kind cat? Do I believe that a cat and a, and a, and a tiger have a common ancestor? Uh, I believe that they're related. Okay. I want to see it that okay. way. I believe, I believe that they're related. So then there's something of a snafu because common house cats and Bengal tigers share, when you compare their, their genome side by side, they share about 95.5% of their DNA as, as being similar, right? Okay. But humans and chimpanzees share, depending on who you're talking to and whether you're looking at coding base pairs or not, 95 to 99%. So why from an empirical sense, right? Because what we're, what, at least with Kent, you know, I had a very similar conversation, which is that, you know, he wants to say that mm -hmm. there, there's a scientific basis Right. If you want to tell me that you're not an animal and you're not an ape, and the reason is because you accept the very literal version of, gen of Genesis and of the Bible, that's cool. The problem comes when you say that it's scientific, because by the same criteria that you're using to place house cats and tigers as, as related to each other, they classify moreover for not just humans and chimps, but gorillas, orangutans, um, and, and all of the gibbons. So do you see what I'm saying? You're, 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 you have a double standard for related. Double, no, 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 no. I don't have a double standard. I have a point because again, I see cats producing cats. I see dogs producing, well, I see dogs producing dogs, felines producing felines. But when it comes to humans and apes, like, like I said, there's a big difference between the two. Number one, we can reason, you know what I mean? We can, we, I ain't gonna say that, that, that they don't think. I'm just gonna use reason there for, for right now. But we can reason and they can't. We don't behave like them. We're not in zoos, they are. We have dominion over them, like the Bible says, and they don't. You understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of differences between us and them. You know what I mean? They, they don't cook their food. And then on top of that, and this is something I mentioned in my, um, in my opening statement, evolution is supposed to help us in, uh, um, adapt to the environment, right? There's a big difference between an ape and, 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 and me and you. When an ape, when an ape is going out in, in the wild, this ape has, a, uh, has fur, and the fur is used to keep it warm. It also has a lot of body fat there too to also keep it warm there too, right? Us, us as human beings, we gotta wear clothes. 
That doesn't make no sense. There are those of us that live in, in some really cold climates that if evolution was true, we would be able to, uh, 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 to be able to retain all of that fur in order to survive in those environments. Okay. But we're not. So and me... that is one of the things that is taught by evolution is that, 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 that we have to adapt in the environment. Come on. So let me answer both of those questions in as quick succession as I can. All right, gotcha. One, when you, you know, you're kind of conflating two things, at least for that's what I'm picking up. Uh, you're saying that evolution constantly makes things better, but then you're also sort of uh, uh, accepting the fact that better depends on the environment. There is no ultimate fitness, right? There is no, this animal will ultimately be more fit than any other animal because the second you change the environment, what is most fit changes. So for instance, let's take, uh, let's take bacteria, let's take um, bacteria that makes you sick for an example, right? If you have a bacteria that makes you really, really sick, right? When you, when it gets into your system, right? Mm -hmm. um, you go and take some anti antibiotics and right. those antibiotics kill the bacteria. Right. But what happens when it doesn't kill all of them? And then some of the bacteria, the ones that aren't killed by the antibiotics reproduce and create you know, super bacteria, essentially. They're bacterially or uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Right. If you put those antibiotic resistant bacteria into an original, a, a totally separate environment where there are no antibiotics, mm -hmm. it's going to survive at a lower rate than the regular old bacteria. Which one survives and causes you the most problems changes whether or not antibiotics are present. That right. means the environment dictates who's the most fit. So the same is true with any organism across the board. Now, I want to right. answer the question with regard to, to chimpanzees, right? So chimpanzees are absolutely quite a bit stronger than we are. But have you ever seen a chimpanzee try to paint or try to throw a ball on like fun videos about the zoo, like zoo videos on YouTube? I, I, I kind of want to get back to this topic about like what, what we just got finished talking this is, about. This is entirely I'm relevant. Move the goalposts. I actually want to talk about that topic again, though. I, I don't want to go back it's here. Relevant. About being fit and all that. I want to talk about that for a minute. Trust me, it's relevant, G Man. So when a chimpanzee tries to paint, they can't do it. They go like this. And the reason is because from an evolutionary perspective, the way that their muscles are set up is right. very different from a modern human. It's also why they can't throw very well. Right. They have way less dexterity than we do. So while they may be much stronger, dexterity mm -hmm. when it comes to throwing, you know, projectile weapons as a hominid on mm -hmm. the savanna would be heavily selected for against having pure brute strength. So you see why, again, we're moving the environment from being in a crowded jungle where throwing a spear isn't going to get you anywhere and being brutally strong is better to being an open savanna the environment has changed. We're dealing with a different, you know, different antibacterial ver resistant organisms versus regular old bacteria, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or now it's advantageous to you to not necessarily be brutally strong, but to have great precision when you're throwing a sharp object. Okay. All right. So I, I really just want to get back to this other topic here regarding um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the relation between us and um, the relation between us and... Uh, Wait, and, did you see how that was relevant? And, no, I don't. And that's why I'm going to get back to this here in a minute. And, and I got my reason for this, okay? Because this is a hot topic here, okay? If we evolve from these ape-like creatures and the end of, I, mean, I don't know all of the orders of them. I don't have it in front of me because normally when I have a debate, I'll, I'll have like all of that in front of me. But the point of the matter is we're supposed to be evolving from an ape-like creature. An ape-like creature uh, uh, doesn't lose its fur uh, 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 in a cold environment the way evolution is, the, the way evolution is, uh, is talked about um, among scientists, okay? If they are supposed to adapt in their environment and only the strongest ones are supposed to survive their environments, okay, then we human beings shouldn't be losing our fur. We should be gaining more fur in, in places like Canada and places that are really cold in climate. Hold yep. on a second. Let, let me ask you, why do you think an ape wouldn't lose its fur if you put it in, a let's say, a temperate climate? Let's say you took 60, uh, let, let's say you put, took 60 chimpanzees, right, and mm -hmm. you put them in, in temperate America. Right. What do you think can happen to their fur now that they're experiencing winters? Is it going to get maybe okay. thicker, or is it going to go? Away? They're supposed to gain more fur so that they can survive. And the ones that don't survive, the ones where yeah. their fur is coming, hold on a minute, where they're, 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 where they're losing their fur, they're going to die off. But the ones that have more fur are the ones that's actually going to strive and survive, right? Yeah. So, so that's true then. If they're constantly evolving, you know, then, then we're supposed to have a lot of fur during our um, uh, 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 
in, in these colder environments. I mean, what okay? happens that's not what we're seeing. We see what happens when you put a chimpanzee into a hotter environment. Well, in a hotter environment, in, in a hotter environment, if evolution is true, which it is not, they are supposed to lose it. So I that's, believe that that's these exactly, are designed, that's I believe these exactly animals are designed to live in certain parts of the world, to survive in certain parts of the world, and there is no proof at all. all. In, in, in this entire conversation we've been having here, you have not been able to give me any sound uh, uh, scientific <laughs> evidence to suggest that new anatomical features are going to show up to show that I'm related to a primate. He man, so, um, you, realize, you realize you so just you, me down you realize though that you just you just proved my point. Humans, How did I do that? Human beings, right, are distant ancestors, of course, but. Why do you think, according to evolutionary theory, humans lost their fur because they went from being in a hot, humid jungle, right, where they're at least protected by, by the trees and the fur is, is sort of uh, uh, an assistance when it comes to kind of rustling through all of those branches and indeed it's, it's less arid, than say an extremely arid, very hot savanna where fur of, the, of a chimpanzee's length is incredibly I didn't prove your point. I proved my point because there are people still living in these cold environments and they don't have this fur. Again, right. if we evolved from these animals, hold on a minute, if, if, if we evolved from these animals, we would still have this fur. Eugene. Again, there is no scientific data to suggest that these, am that these new am anatomical features came about to show that we're related to them. However, I can sit here all day long and explain why a common designer would make these animals in a certain way for them to survive in a certain environment. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is the evolutionists watching this are going to say, oh, you know, the people that are saying G-Man won are going to say G-Man lost. And I'm going to ask them later on about how did she prove that there was any uh, am new, new anatomical features and it wasn't even there. And I want to get to the fossils at some point. So we can we talk can. about the table. But I want to get to those fossils we next. We can, but I want to take a moment because you've, you've said quite a bit, and I want to explain precisely the problem with, with, with what you just said and why indeed I feel that you proved my point. So according to evolutionary theory, humans lost their fur because they transitioned thanks to a, to a movement of the Eastern African rift uh, into a savanna-like environment. And it would have been very advantageous not to have the fur. And you asked, well, then why don't humans that live in cold climates have fur? Here's the exact reason why? The reason is because to lose the fur, it took about 12 to 7-ish million years, according to evolutionary theory. How long has it been since we've lost, how long has it, do you think it's been, and I'm going to answer this myself, since humans began moving north according to evolutionary theory, because you're complaining that, that it's I don't believe the earth is millions of years old. I believe that the earth is thousands of years old. With, so you're, with, not gonna get a, you're not going to get a million years old argument for me. With you, but what I'm saying is according to evolutionary theory, because what you mm -hmm. previously said is evolution yeah. creates this, these, oh, the problems are created by evolution as a concept for itself, and then it can't solve those problems. I'm trying to explain to you why if we're, if we're going to accept evolution as, as, a, as a conventional form of science, these problems cease to exist. So here's my point. I hope you're still with me. I'm listening to you. I'm just, you're cracking me up. You're not making your point, but go ahead. Humans 300,000 years ago, again, according to evolutionary theory, started to leave Africa, right? Homo sapiens started to leave Africa. Earlier than that, we see Heidelbergensis leave Africa, and we see uh, Erectus leave Africa, right? Are you still with me? No, we don't see that. That's what they tell us we see. Okay, we know we're going with according to evolutionary theory. So okay, gotcha. right. we're going under that assumption. All right. These individuals spread out, but since that has happened, it has been less than 1 million years. And in addition to that, humans started doing what? wearing clothes, wearing the skins of the animals that they killed. That means the selection for fur to come back, so like the hairier humans would survive in the colder environments, is gone. It's out of here. There is no selection for more fur on humans because they're wearing clothes now. Do you see why under an evolutionary worldview, this isn't contradictory? Is that a faith or is that, a, 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 is that empirical? I'm just curious. Is that what? Is that a faith or is that empirical? Well, based off of the fact that we have 
so probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of fossil individuals through geologic time and indeed across geologic space. Wait a minute, you have what? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. You have thousands of what? Of fossils? I don't think you can look at a fossil and tell that a fossil was wearing uh, dead skins. You is can it a when you find, or is it empirical? You can when you find them with the skins, G Man. You can when they're wearing the skins. Again, oh, again. Well, well, actually, can you show me proof? Can you show me proof? A, a hundred percent. Can you show me proof? Do you want to see it right? You want me to take the time right now to pull this up? I want you to show me the proof where you see a Neanderthal wearing skins, not a museum doing what they think happened. I want to. I want to see a picture of the Neanderthal wearing a skin. That's what I want to see. Done deal. You're going to have to give me a minute, though, because I'm going to have to pull. I've never met a Neanderthal before, so I mean, this is, is going to be pretty cool. So, all right. In interesting. I know it's a faith based position, but, uh, but let me see it. Interestingly enough, in uh, past debates, I've brought this up a couple of times, but I had a, or actually, my, my current boyfriend's father did uh, 23 and Me, and found that his father had up to 5% Neanderthal DNA, which is very interesting. Okay, so can I see this Neanderthal wearing his skin? Absolutely, G. -Man. I don't think you got that. I think I think what you got is a picture, but I still want to see it though. Wait, G Man, hold on, hold on just a second. Hold on. If yeah. I show you a picture of a of a skeleton, if I go to the trouble, because keep in mind, I'm not I'm not about to to you know put put a half hearted effort into finding these sources for you. I'm gonna I'm gonna find you an excellent pristine picture. And if I do, are you going to tell me that that one it's a conspiracy? Or two, that I can't prove that it wore clothes in, in its life, because I'm not going to go to the trouble if you're going to tell me one of those two things. Well, I don't know what I'm going to say. I got to see. I'm asking you if I can show I don't you. know what I'm going to say. I need to see it, though. Yeah, but I'm not going to go to the effort if you're going to give me one of those two answers. Well, I don't know what I'm going to tell you. I got to be to see it first. And I guess we're at an impasse, and I'll have to send it to you after the debate, because I'm okay, not Okay, then you can do that, then. Well, I'm going to assume that it's a faith and that it is not empirical because none of us was here when this animal was doing this, okay? He's and if it's a faith and it's what they thought happened or what they think happened, okay, then you can't automatically assume that you're right about what you're saying. At this point, I can say that you're indoctrinated and that you have received this from your teacher and you can believe it because your teacher told you this. Even did you just call him- I gotta be able to prove that this actually happened. Did you just call a Neanderthal an animal? No. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it from an evolutionary perspective. Right, but you just said- I don't believe Neanderthals existed. I believe that there are human beings. I believe that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. That's what I believe, okay? okay I believe that, that, that we have a common, I believe we have a common designer. And I believe that the reason why animals behave the way they, be, they behave, human beings behave the way they behave, and, 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 and the reason why the thing going, uh, 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 goes on in the world with this creation, is because we have a common designer. I do not see any evidence whatsoever. And, 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 and mind you, you can go back and look at this video if you want after we have this debate. There is no evidence in, in, in this entire uh, in this entire debate between me and you where you have shown how the DNA mutates in such a way. You, you can tell me a theory how it happened, but you gotta be able to prove it has happened where, where these animals have these new anatomical features. And then a fossil record, okay? You say you want to talk about the new, the, the, the transition. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. There are zero transitional forms. So what you're asking me to do, you realize this, right? What you're right. asking me to do is precisely what you said you weren't asking for at the beginning. Right. When we, what do you first, mean? Started, when we first started, you said, I'm, I'm not asking you to, put, to provide every single step. I'm, I'm just wanting, you know, how does it go from point A to point B? So I provide a mechanism and I provide an example in the form of, of the flagella or indeed in the form of the tetrapods. And I, and I show the fossil evidence. I show that for birds and I show that for tetrapods. But you look at that and you say, well, what about what about the transition between tiktaalik and pendric or, and uh, uh, acanthostega? And then I say, well, we don't have one yet. And then you're going to say something along the lines of like, see, that proves it. You don't Even know what I'm going to say. You got to let me say it in order if, uh, if, before you can say what I'm going to say. You can't do that. Because well, if I did that with you, then you would tell me that I'm assuming and I know how and I know how the whole assumption game goes. And I want to give you an opportunity to say it so I don't put words in your mouth. That's very disrespectful for me to do something like that. Right, but you That's why I want to see it first. Because then if I, I'll concede if what I see can be proven scientifically. If I can't see it, then you, you can't ask me to lie. I have to Look at what you're going to show me, and then make a, and then make a decision based on what I'm looking at, based on the information that I presently have on the topic. So here's the thing, though, with that G-man, and and I've done this before with people. The reason I'm wary is because I have been burned by this exact 
kind of thing before, where I say something along the lines of like, well, what would an ape man transition look like to you? And then they refuse to provide an example. So because they're concerned, obviously, that when I pull up a picture, it could potentially match that. That's why I'm saying if I'm going to go to the trouble to pull up one or hopefully three, if, I, if I'm doing this right, sources to, to bolster my point that Neanderthals indeed wore clothes, um, then I need to know whether or not that's going to make a difference in your worldview. Otherwise, I'm using up debate time for something that I don't even know is going to make a difference. Have you p potentially- Well, you told me earlier before we started this show that you're mostly going to be talking to the audience. If, 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 if I don't receive what you're going to say, you can say, audience, I don't know if Gmail is going to accept this, but let me tell you why this is what I believe. I'm being as sincere as possible with this. Absolutely. You know what I'm like I said, I went, with, I went to a, the, the Museum of Natural History with like five people who are evolutionists. We, we was friends at the time, as I think we were. And, um, you know, when we went there, they showed me some things. I agreed on some things and I disagreed on some things. What I'm saying is you got to be able to show me what you're talking about. After I see what you're talking about, then I can make a, I can make a decision on, on, on what you're showing me. If, if not, we can go to the fossils if you like. Well, but the thing is, is that I'm not willing to take time out of the debate for something that I don't know is going to make a difference. Because as I did say in, in our conversation beforehand, the reason that I have these conversations is because my hope is that someone in the audience might get something out of it, whatever that may be. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to just not engage in the conversation with the other person. Otherwise, I'd just make videos and I'd not debate at all, because then I'd know that the audience is just getting my content. The, the, the conversation, the discussion is part of it. It's important. Now, right, I mean, right. We can get to the fossil record if you want. If, no, if that's, the that's, I mean, that's fine. And, and, you know, hopefully, and I will tell this to the audience then, once I have some, some time not engaged in, in conversation, I'll find sources for you and, and place them in the comments in Gmail. I hope you will check them out as well. I look at everybody's sources. Everybody. Yeah. I'm glad I'm, that's a good practice. Gmail's so, read all the sources. We will go to... <laughs> no, Sorry. I didn't read all of the sources. We'll go to <laughs> any source that exists. Uh, we will go to the Q&A soon. Thanks uh, for your patience. It's all good. Trust me. It's all good. He hasn't, it's I was kidding. He hasn't read every source. Okay, okay. go ahead, Erica. It's good with me too. I'm I've, I'm all for for passion. You know, I'm just I'm just trying to honestly, Jimin. I'm trying to figure out what you want. I'm trying to figure out you know because because I feel honestly, and, and I do want to talk about the fossil record, but I I feel like you'll ask for something and I'll explain it, and then it's either not good enough, or but but you can't explain why it's not good enough. I guess it's because you want something very stepwise, which mutation by mutation. I cannot provide, nor do I think anyone will ever be able to provide a mutation by mutation step from a single cellular organism to modern humans. But by all means, do, 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 what, what, do, what fossils would you like to discuss? I want to see uh, uh, the fossils from, okay, again, one of my big things, honestly, truly with evolutionists is when they tell me, again, like I'm, I'm related to a gazelle, right? Or I'm related to a deer, or I'm related to like a bear or something like that, right? I want them to show me the transitional fossils between between the, uh, I don't know, whatever animal, from that animal to a human. Because I know that there's a lot of uh, a shady things that's going on in the evolutionary. I'm not saying you, because you're, I don't think you're an archaeologist. I don't think you've been out there and excavated bones and said it was something. I'm not saying you. But there are people in power who are scientists who, who, who have kind of messed with the information a little bit. You understand what I'm saying? I do, but I'm Why not. You don't necessarily got to show me all the steps. I need to see enough of them to be able to get your understanding on why you believe I'm related to a bear. Like you can see a bear, right? Then you can show me how it could have branched off. And then you could have shown me like how the changes could have happened to show me how, you know, you got to a human to show me relation. You know what I mean? If you can do that, then I'm more receptive to what you have to say. If you can't, then I have to call out evolution as being a faith. I don't understand why that's not precisely what I did at the beginning of this debate. I mean, for from my perspective, the fact that two entirely independent methods corroborate one another, that is to say, molecular clock, genetics, things like this, and the age of the rock that we find fossils in, completely in, completely independent from one another, they match up like a like almost perfectly. You know, and the interesting thing is about that is the same goes for for these transitional fossils, right? I mean, you're not going to find like let's take the let's take the ancestor of of one of the ancestors of, of like dogs and bears, a relative of dogs and bears, an amphibian on it, probably looked very much like a dog and a bear, or rather a wolf and a bear uh, mixed together. 
right? The thing is, is that we find this animal in, in strata, right? In rock strata, where we way lower than we find any dogs and any bears, that is to say any canids and any ursids, way below. So, so that combined, and interestingly enough, this is my point here. When you date that amphicyonid and then you go and do a molecular, like you try to find a divergence time in, in the genes for bears or canids rather and, and ursids, they match. So why, from my perspective, I don't, it is beyond me how that is not at least convincing in some aspect to, to you as an individual when you're like, well, how do you prove that, you know, a, a dog and a bear share a common ancestor? Well, because their molecular divergence time and their fossil record divergence time match and they shouldn't under your worldview, they should be one should be out of left, maybe, maybe you get one match in the entire animal kingdom. But the problem is we get these matches over and over and over again with numerous different genera across time and across the animal kingdom. So it doesn't make sense to me, like what you're asking for. To me, that answers the question. Everybody's got a different set of burden. Everybody has, has got their own set of burden of proof. You know what I mean? Me, not burden of proof. Uh, 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 I have a certain amount of uh, evidence that's going to, that is going to take that's going to take to convince me of anything. I'm one of the hardest people on on this net, on the internet, to change my mind on anything. So if I ask you for a certain a, a certain amount of evidence for something, and I see a person can't do it, then I try to find somebody who can. One of the things I said about you before I came on here is I said that you're probably the smartest evolutionist I've ever talked to on here. And I talked to Thunderfoot. I talked to Dragon. I talked to Fiona. She's got a PhD. I talked to some pretty smart people here. Red Line's a smart guy when it comes to evolution. However, however, I can't, uh, me and you are different. There's just a certain amount of, of, of proof you're going to have to be able to show me in order for you to convince me that I share a common ancestor with these particular animals. And so, a lot of people get frustrated talking to me about it. So I understand how you feel. So what would that, uh, two things. One, I would love to know, um, and, and I want to give you all the time that you can, because these are two kind of big questions. One, what kind of evidence would convince you? And then two, what kind of evidence convinces you that young earth creationism is so is so powerful of a, so such a parsimonious explanation? I'll do the young earth, the, the young earth one first, because I think you already know what I'm gonna say for the first question. Um, the young earth, uh, yes, I'll openly admit that my that that the Bible has a lot to do with that. I'll openly admit that. Okay. And I go by the time frame that's in the scriptures. However, I am open to the earth maybe being, I don't know what, 10,000 or 15,000 years old. I have a friend on, on YouTube called True Empiricism. He makes argument for this, arguments for this. And I'm more likely to take his position than I am for millions of years. All right. So the Bible has a lot to do with that. Plus, I don't trust the dating, um, the dating system that they have on, on, on how they're going about determining how old a rock is. I've done some research and have seen that some of these dating methods have shown that, 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 that one rock will be millions of years old or thousands of years old, and then they'll go test a, 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 a rock that was recently made because it was chiseled off a, off a boulder or whatever, or like a pebble or whatever, and then that one will be like thousands of years, and it isn't because the rock was just there. You know what I mean? You can't say that it's millions of years old. And then they're telling me that these fossils are, are millions of years old, and they're finding red blood cells inside of these fossils. There's a lot of problems with the theory of evolution. Then there's Lucy. They didn't even find the whole thing, and they're claiming this is how Lucy looked, you know. And they won't even admit that 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 this is what we think she looks like. They're telling us this is what she was like. This is how she walked. This is how she interacted in the environment, and that's not true. They have to say that is a faith, and that this is what we think happened. Now, to, to answer your first question, honestly, if you can't show me the anatomical features. Uh, maybe you can't do it today because of the time that we have in this debate. You only had 10 minutes, to be fair, in your opening statement would be the transitional form. That's why I didn't want to go into that because that would have been totally unfair because I would have had you talking for, we, we probably wouldn't have been talking about nothing else had we went into the fossil. I, okay. I would I would love to have a conversation about that with you uh, at another juncture for sure because I, I very much like the fossils. Um, I think that with regards to your first, I, I want to make a quick comment about radiometric dating. Right. So I've seen, I again, I was a young earth creationist when I was in middle school and uh, very, very lightly into high school. Um, but they told us the same thing. Um, and they, they had a lot of different sort of examples, usually from Mount St. Helens or, or New Zealand volcanic rock and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found that compelling at the time, but 
once I looked into it, right, one, you can't date brand new volcanic rock because they're physically, you can't. Like the, there's, there hasn't been enough decay to actually get an accurate reading. That's why you get wild readings all across the clock because there, not enough decay has actually occurred, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, in conjunction with that, radiometric dating is vitally important to the natural gas industry, the oil industry, and the coal industry. And they right. use evolutionary assumptions, quote unquote, uh, to find these things. You know, so, uh, you know, while I think, you know, to summarize, right, one, there's a huge problem with the, the examples that creationists use. And two, they completely never touch on, at least in my experience, the hundreds upon thousands of times radiometric dating has yielded correct dates to the degree in which that it impacts our economy greatly. So I, I think you, I want to recommend a book to you when, when, you know, when I was, a, I'm not going to talk about sort of my religious beliefs, but there's a book called The Bible, Rocks, and Time. It's by two Christian geologists. They're both, I'm not sure if they're old earth or theistic evolutionists or what, but they're excellent geologists regardless. And they, they lay it out in like 115 pages, just why radiometric dating works so the well. authors who are the authors um let me pull it up hold on all right and while you're doing that hello everybody out there in tv land me i don't hate erica we're just having a spirited conversation about science okay davis young and ralph f steerly so i have it upstairs but um because i'm actually at my parents house hold right on, now. let me write that down let me let me get that again the davis who it's uh davis young and ralph young. f steerly S-T-E-A-R-L-E-Y. It's called The Bible, Rocks, and Time. You said um, Rob Steerly? Uh, Ralph Steel Steerly. Ralph, gotcha. So I, I really recommend that you check it out, G-Man. If, if that book isn't going to turn you into at least an old earth creationist, nothing's going to. Um, it, it's, it's very compelling, and the whole first third, like, talks about sort of very it's pretty theology heavy actually very interestingly enough but but the stuff that it covers you know covers green river formation uh, mount st helens all that good stuff um, are you aware why why many of us believe that the earth is young and and, and what our positions because we never really if you if you think about it in this debate we really didn't talk about nothing if you really think about it but are you aware of why we believe the earth is so young as far as i know from from my conversations with young earth creationists it comes from the estimates of sort of how old the, the generation estimates by by bishop lightfoot usher lightfoot so he was the right. same right who or no bishop usher and lightfoot separate people i think um, this is just to, to, to calm down the conversation so we don't like be so attackative on each other yeah sure and um, really fast i i would love to if you want to g man i would love to have a conversation it can be on your channel it can be anywhere on Lucy slash transitional fossils. I have a lot to say about Lucy. Um, okay, great. I'll, I'll, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to bring a couple of friends with me and we can talk about it. Talk okay, about please, please do. We can we can do a, a rowdy chat. it would be a fun time. I'm going to need an email address. So you can give it to me later and I can contact you. All right. So if you start from Adam in the book of Genesis, I don't know if you believe any of that, but uh, if you start from Adam uh, all the way to, you know, the, the, um, from Adam to, 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 to where we are today, some people conclude that the earth is only about 6,000, 6,500 years old or whatever, right? Now, some people don't necessarily believe that the, that, that the word day in the Bible necessarily means like a 24 hour day. You know, I think you already know that. Some people believe that it's like a thousand years. Some of them think it's a couple of million years or whatnot. So that's why you have some creationists that think the earth is, is older and you have some creationists that believe that, that the earth is younger. I take the position that these are literal 24 hour days. I also open myself up to the possibility that I could be wrong about that, okay? Because I have friends in this community that believe that the Earth is um, is, is a little bit older than what, a little bit older than what I think. But for right now, I have no problem saying that the Earth is six thousand five hundred years old. It might be a little bit older, and yes, I can be convinced of that if somebody can do a Bible study with me and show me that. You know, I mean, as far as the science go, are you there, James? What's going on over there, man? You all right? I'm totally here. I was just going to say, any moment, we should switch over to q and I've just been all caught right, up with how right. exciting you know, this has been. We can talk on my YouTube channel about this because, again, this, this debate isn't going to do it justice, the amount of things that we need to talk about regarding the fossil record, you know, and, and regarding some other things. And I'm going to make sure whoever I bring on my channel is going to be respectful because I got some friends that ain't going to be there, like, you know, maybe I'll get standing for truth, then maybe I'll get, like, because you guys are cool, right? You can say Hey man, if I can handle you, I can handle anyone. <laughs> All right, cool. So you're okay now, right? You don't hate me no more. You're not like no hey, more. I didn't, I didn't hate you at any point in this conversation, G man. Just just because uh, just because we disagree on on things that I would find quite conventional, it doesn't mean I don't like you. 
All right, cool. cool. Let's, let's, let's stick with that thing. Cool. Thank All you. All right, James, let's get to the much. audience. Because most of the stuff is G-Man wins, and G-Man's a turd, and G-Man's a horrible person. Let's get to it right now. Come on. You bet. Yeah. My pleasure. Okay. <laughs> thanks yeah. so much. Do want to say a couple of things really quick as quick reminders. First, thanks so much for being with us, folks. As always, it's always fun. And I uh, do want a quick read first because we want to say thanks so much, Brian Stevens, for being a Patreon patron. And his Patreon question was, G-Man, do you believe if they had completed the Tower of Babel that they would have reached to God as the scriptures uh put in words one way or another i apologize could you repeat that again uh, james not a problem so uh brian steven said g man do you believe that if they had completed the tower of babel that they would have reached god as the uh no, in some no, words no 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 and, and, and not only would they have not they wasn't trying to literally go into outer space i think what they were trying to do is make their name great that's what they were really trying to do and god stopped that and obviously you know uh, uh spread them all across the, across the earth or whatever. But they wasn't really trying to go into outer space and all of that, no. Gotcha. Plus, we know from Wotan yesterday, space isn't real, so obviously. Next, thanks so much for your question from Joshua Larson, who said, G-Man won. Very nice. You got a fan oh, out there, G-Man. Congratulations, G-Man. Michael Dresden <laughs> says... I won a headache. <laughs> Michael Dresden says, start now in capital letters. I think those two must have come in before we uh, started the stream. Thanks, Kent Hovind's cellmate for your super chat as well. I kind of doubt that's really a cellmate. G-Man, I'll get the migraine medication ready. Oh, yeah, definitely get the migraine uh, medication ready for me, totally. I, I definitely need some of that because I want a headache. You know what I mean? I also want an apple and a plum, too. You know, I'm going to make sure I pick that up a little bit later, you know? Hey, you know, listening, my, my voice is at a very high frequency and it's very nasally. It can induce headaches in some. So, you know, take, take at your own risk. Gotcha. I am not saying that Erica gave me a headache. I'm just saying I won a headache. Appreciate Same. that. Good we'll to it. know. <laughs> Next up, appreciate your uh, super chat from Florida Man who says, Lord Frog's glorious ribbit predicts Erica wins. Very oh, nice. Bent Hovind no relation, says Dapper Dino is willing to host an after show. Well, absolutely, Dapper Dino, if you email me the link or put it in the live chat, either way, I uh, can link that in the description as well. We're willing to link after shows to both sides of any particular topic. So, Steven, Steve, thanks for your uh, super chat. Said G-Man is only here for Erica's concession speech. <laughs> Got you, thanks. Steven Steen also says... James Erica couldn't. The hardest evolutionist I've ever debated before on the internet. She's the most uh, difficult evolutionist. Very hey, man, nice. It's very sweet of you. I appreciate that. Gotcha. That, that means a lot coming from the, the internet's best debater of all time. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> no, boy, this is catching on like wildfire. Uh, let's see. And another one, Stephen Steen. Thanks for your super chat. Says James couldn't have come by accident. Perfection. Thank you, Steven. Next up, Movie Theory uh, says, G-Man already won. Evolutionists are charlatans. Erica, Movie Theory is coming at you. Listen, I don't know what to say. I, I knew when I was coming into this that I was debating G-Man. You know, I, I brought it upon myself. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Brandon Ardeline for your super chat. They said, I need a drink. Anyone else need one? <laughs> Merlin... 72001, thanks for your super chat, who said, Going in, I hope people know G-Man doesn't know what analogies are and refuses to recognize fallacies. Also, loves, in all caps, to make up his own personal definitions for otherwise well-understood terms. Somebody sounds butthurt. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, very nice. I'll have to remember that quote. Schrodinger's cat, thanks for your super chat, who says, I'm extreme isolated at my lake house. No one here. Sorry to hear that, Schrodinger's cat. Hopefully the uh, community in the live chat has made you feel welcome. We're glad to have you with us tonight. And Decepticons Forever, thanks for your super chat. They said, G-Man already lost this. Uh, G-Man already lost this, and Erica hasn't even spoken. Not possible. Wow. I, have, I have a fan amongst the masses. Someone's rooting for me against the G. I gotta congratulate you. You won. I know. Oh. Erica. Erica. Maybe, maybe, you know, that made my top 10 for the week. I also found a toad in my garden yesterday, which was nice. 
Very nice. And stupid whore energy. Thanks for your super chat. She's here. You She's know. in the house. Says most of the propel on that. Okay, I think she meant people. Very embarrassing. On that yeah. descent from Darwinism list, besides the list being almost a decade old, are engineers. G man. Okay, G man, you answer this. I, w- I want to comment on that. I actually took a note about that. She, stupid whore energy. You're you're on top of it, girl. Go ahead, G man. Sorry, that was. Free. Oh yeah, I like the comment on this. Uh, most of the people that want to debate evolution, besides Erica, uh, don't got a degree and need to go to school and learn what the theory is. Gotcha. Okay. I would like to get James. Can I? Can I For sure. chime in? I also wrote down not a single biology or anthropology person, and all of the biology relations were on a molecular level. So I would be very interested in to, in seeing sort of where they're coming from. If it's almost more of a once you get to macroscopic life, this is this is something that's quite doable uh, because most of the people, at least in academia, uh, that I know of, your your Stephen Myers, etc., um, their problem is usually with abiogenesis and, and sort of with those first couple of steps. Um, and I would also be interested to see when that list was garnered and if it's changed since the recent multicellularity paper came out. Gotcha. Uh, before you say anything, Dan, let me say something about this. So, so uh, I, I've had somebody say that before that there wasn't that many biologists on the, um, on the list, but there's quite a few of them on here. I, would, I got a recommendation for you, Erica. Look at that list before you go into a hangout and say that, because I got some friends on here that will point out all of the biologists on there. Be, be careful, okay? I'm nice. I got some other friends over here, like Nephi Free and those guys, that are gonna start naming all these guys. Oh, so not Nephi. No. Oh, no. Nephi <laughs> Free is in the that. live chat, I'll let you know. We're Nephi. excited to have I... Nephi here. Have you faced Nephi yet, Erica? No, I think Nephi's a secret fan of mine, though. He's shown up in quite a few. I, I always see him in these chats, and I'm, I'm always thinking, oh, Nephi, like, I'm so glad he showed up. You know? He is a – Nephi and G-Man are, like, two of the oldest in the sense of – like, oldest YouTubers in the sense that they've been in the game the longest. They're legends of YouTube debate. So, <laughs> like, it's funny that, like, I can't remember who it was. It was, like, Destiny or someone who's, you know, you could say internet famous. And I – somehow G-Man's – name came up during a debate and they're like oh i remember g man like g man <laughs> traces so far back that uh like even these huge name internet famous people know of him so uh really funny that's next up though. huh that's a compliment though it I is know. yeah both neff and g man yeah. and uh appreciate that let's see michael I somebody i want to talk to again uh in a public setting and then when we get an opportunity, we can put an hour or two into the fossils. I really want to like put some time into that. Please do. I gotta, it, you know, I gotta bring in uh, a, my own guys too, though, because I my expertise ends at at hominins. You know, when it comes to the fossil. Well, no, my expertise ends at at primates because I, I know a decent amount going back that far. But I gotta, we're gonna be discussing anything other than than ant stuff. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get a, the gang together, D man. Yeah, your channel. As a matter of fact, I want to take an opportunity. If you haven't seen her YouTube channel yet, because I've taken the notice of your views and your subscribe, why don't you guys go subscribe to Erica's YouTube channel? She's respectful for the most part. She's got a little snarky with the Bible and everything and whatnot. But for the most part, compared to everybody else in this community, she's actually respectful. So hey, come for my Erica. animated intros. I've got cute animated intros. That's the big draw. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry, we derailed that again. That happens. You're still wrong about evolution, but still, go <laughs> Next up, appreciate your uh, super chat from Michael Dresden. Uh, I'm skipping that one. I just mean. Movie theory, thanks for your super chat. I don't know. This one's borderline. I have a feeling this isn't real. Dear Erica, I'm an atheist and haven't talked to a girl before. Will you be my girlfriend? We can watch Star Trek together. Come on, seriously. Very, very kind of you. But very To the dismay of the hyper-nerd community, I, I am taken, unfortunately. I... I'm in a very long-term relationship, so we'll, you know, he's he's my biggest fan. He's my first YouTube subscriber. Got to kind of give him a little credit for that. Very nice. Next up, appreciate, uh, why would you even watch Star Trek when you can watch Star Wars? Apollo Jedi, oh gosh. Uh, evolutionists are charlatans. Evolution's a myth. I'm assuming that's for me. I think I disagree. so. disagree. <laughs> they, uh, they're coming at you. Maynard Saves, thanks for your super chat, who said, 4G dude. What day, according to God's creation, were mushrooms made? Jargon joke on a moral. I'm confused. 
Thanks for that. Anamorphic Mind, thanks for your super chat. Who says, does G-Man know that he is the butt of the joke here? Oh, come on. I like you, G-Man. Don't worry about it. Yeah, no worry about it. Yeah, and for the person that said I'm the butt of the jokes, I, I, and this is what I would have said if I had my notes. I just remember this. I would have said in the beginning of this, I would have lost because the majority of the people watching this are atheists. They don't like me, you know, and you're going to win because they're going to vote you the winner. Yay! Gotcha. <laughs> Appreciate that. I'm, I'm in the corner, G man. I'm, I'm, I'm rooting. I'm rooting for you over here. I'm a fan. All right, gotcha. I, I actually care more about the conversation, Erica. More, so more, more about the, you know, the, the debate. I don't care about the, about the trolling. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Next up, want to let people know. I will pin any debate challenge in the live chat because we love debate. We love these public challenges. It's like WWE Raw when you used to have during the Attitude Era, like Triple H would come down and challenge Austin. The right attitude. there in front of everybody. That's right. The golden years of WWE. But yes, I will put any debate challenge. That's a real debate challenge. I will pin it. So thanks so much for that. Appreciate also Anamorphic Mind. We read that. Stupid Horror Energy. Thanks for your super chat. Who says, how do you explain the evolution of completely new genes like Jingwei? Hopefully I'm saying that right. Who? Uh, is, is that for me or G-Man? I'm not sure. I would guess it's... You, I think. Me? Mm. Um... Well, the thing is, is chemistry does a lot of weird things. Um, and most of our sort of novel uh, genomic emergences, right, or emergence, I, I butchered that plural, uh, they show up pretty early because generally the principle with evolution is if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which is why you're not going to see like um, drastic changes in like how the, the code of DNA, of DNA works, right, your, your, your base pairs. Um, so I think that I don't know. I think that's a really good question. I wish I could give you a better answer, but again, I'm, I'm not a geneticist. I, I would point you in the direction of someone whose specialty lies there as in regard to your specifics, the specifics of that. Um, that's the best I can do. Gotcha. Appreciate that. Next up, appreciate your super chat from Stupid Horror Energy, who strikes again, now asking for G-Man, what is a fundamentally new biological feature between chimps and humans? A fundamental... What? What is a fundamentally new biological feature between chimps and humans? That burden is not on me. That burden is on um, on, on the evolutionists. They explain that, um, especially since they're saying that we're related. You know, uh, I assume stomach acid. I don't know. <laughs> they have the burden to be able to explain that to me. I'm the one trying to learn about this. You know. So. Gotcha. Um, I think if you're looking for for something rather novel between humans and chimps, a fun one that I, I like to tote out every now and again is actually humans are the only primates with a chin. Um, and I don't mean like a sort of like an outjetting, but when you look at the human skull, there's actually on all humans, even people who look like they have weak chins, um, there's there's a divot that comes out or a little, rather a little edge. Um, and it's actually one of the ways that when you're looking at, at the fossil record that you can kind of differentiate uh, humans from, say, Heidelbergensis or Neanderthalensis, because the chin is rather recent. Um, as for what it's for, I'm not sure. I've heard I've heard some people say that it, it helps with sort of our linguistics, um, the lip movements and things like that, because it's a great anchor point, but I am not sure on that. <laughs> gotcha. Thanks so much. Appreciate, let's see, that super chat, as well as Brandon Ardelines, who says, Erica can't explain perfect organisms like James. That's very kind of you. It's remarkably oh, no. similar to Stevens, but uh, one of Stevens stock account, uh, sock accounts. Alan Bupree, thanks for your super chat, who says, James, has your worldview changed after hosting so many debates? I get asked that a lot. I think that's the by far the most, it's the only question I get asked, but I get asked it a lot. I would say it's, it's shifted a little bit. I uh, had a lot of training in philosophy before the channel, so... Uh, philosophy, it hasn't shifted as much as with like biology. It's been really fun to learn more about biology, flat earth, all of the natural science stuff. I would say, I mean, I was already a flat earther before I started and I still am. So, I mean, pretty much the same. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, but, but we love flat earthers. If you're a flat earther, we do hope you feel welcome. I am still a globe earther and... I would say, yeah, just basically pretty much everything stayed relatively the same, but the, you could say the reasons for and against have become more like filled in. So I think so much of our beliefs are based on our temperament. And so anyway, 
Uh, thanks for that question. Super Horror Energy, appreciate your your uh, super chat. says, G-Man, why do dolphins have genes for legs and humans have yolk producing gene fragments? I don't know, but, all, but I do know this, that dolphins produce dolphins and dolphins have never produced anything other than dolphins. Gotcha. Hopefully that helps. Thanks for that. Maynard saves. Thanks for your super chat. Who said, can mushrooms cure UTI? I mean, was... uh, oh, yes, yes. I definitely believe that mushrooms taste good with peanut butter and jelly. I definitely believe that, yes. Do not eat mushrooms if you have a UTI. Go see your doctor. Go see a urologist. And that's some good advice. Definitely, Erica. Tell them. Yep. Oh, a UTI. The way they spelled it was okay. Gosh, stupid horror energy. Thanks for your super chat. It says, G-Man, do you understand that if a cat produced a human, that would falsify evolutionary theory? I never said that a cat had to produce a human. I understand that a cat has to go do small, that, that, that a cat has to produce offspring. The offspring has to survive. And then when those, and then when those cats have, um, have their offsprings, that they're going to look slightly different from their parents. And it, it's very small changes that happens over a long period of time. In order for in order for uh, evolution to be shown to be true, okay, you got to be able to show these new anatomical features that these cats are going to have, where they become a different kind of an animal, up until the point that you get to apes. You know what I mean? And then prove that um, that, that, that I have relation with them. If you can't do that, then evolution isn't true. Gotcha. Interestingly enough, though, if if over a long period of time. And you had a feline line, like the feline lineage was reproducing in over, let's say, 12 million years. All of a sudden, through that same lineage that you track backwards, you have something that looks vaguely human or vaguely even monkey-like. It would still be a felid. Um, that's the law of monophyly. So for, I think, I'm not saying you, G-Man, but there, I've met people who, um, who don't really understand the law of monophyly. So for those of you out there who don't, now you do. Gotcha. Maybe. Thanks so much. Appreciate the super chat from Bent Hovind, no relation, who says, can we get a G-Man and Nathan Thompson debate? Who's Nathan Thompson? G-Man, would you be willing to defend the globe earth? Would you be willing to, on behalf of us globers out there, all of them out there, would you be willing to defend the globe against Nathan Thompson? I am not debating a flat earther. And the reason why I'm not going to debate a flat earther is... Primarily because, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I think it's a silly debate. I don't want nothing G-Man, to do since when did you get too cool for school? Like, this would be an epic debate. G-Man, yeah, I'm school. good. <laughs> I believe the earth is round. I don't believe it's flat. We'll get you on a tag team debate as partners debating against two evolutionists. What do you think of that? Oh, I, I, I definitely got somebody in mind I can do that with. Yeah, I ain't got no problem with that. G-Man, Go ahead. Me, man, you and me versus uh, Nathaniel and Wotan. Flat Earth. Come on, G-Man. Don't be a Oh, you're debating whether or not the Earth is flat? No, I think the Earth is very round. You and me, globe heads. <laughs> I'll think about it. I'll let you know. I'm, I'm kidding, G-Man. I, I don't think I could I don't think I could debate a flat earther either. So I'm kind of in the same boat. Sorry, James. I know that's the that's like a dream matchup. Well, we could definitely do another dream match, namely G-Man and Nathan Thompson arm in arm going against Erica and Jackson Wheat on Evolution. Oh my God. Yeah, I would do that for sure. That would be epic. So I don't know about that either because... Uh, oh, come on, if Beta! Flat, if he's a flat earther and, and, and I got to support the flat earther point, that's not going to work out. Nah. I'm not doing that. Oh my <laughs> gosh, G Man, hey, such a diva. I don't okay. believe the earth is flat. I believe the earth is round, and I believe the flat earth argument is silly. So, you know. You know what? Wait, All right. We can also team up with Dapper Dino. These would be epic. Yeah, James, you know I'm always down for, for a good old chat about uh about evolution. <laughs> and also, I've been trying to change my PowerPoint so I at least get a little something, a little new flavor every time. So it's not just the, the same old stuff. But sometimes you just got to repeat it. It's It bears repeating. Gotcha. I, yes, I know what you mean. And this this would be so epic, G-Man. Come on, think about it. Okay, next up, appreciate your super chat from Z Leaping Bear. Appreciate it. They said, at James, to back Alan Bopri, has your view changed after seeing the likes of G-Man, Hovind, and Duncan lose over and over? Oh, come on. G-Man's sitting right there. 
Okay, first of all, I don't lose. <laughs> and the same person, and the same person that's making that claim won't actually come into a room and prove that. That's the funny thing about it. I give Erica credit. It took a lot of courage for Erica to, uh, to come in here and talk to a person like me because I could be a pain in the behind. Is Z so, Leaping Bear so one of the people? <laughs> is is Z Leaping Bear one of the people that you call a dragoon? If he's a dragoon, then then I will definitely not have a conversation with. What him. is a dragoon? Oh, a dragoon is somebody who is a follower of this YouTube troll called Dragnut Silvis. Uh, he thinks he knows everything about science. He says in order to be successful in life, you got to do your homework. He believes all of the uh, problems in the world will be solved if you just do your homework. So, I, 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 like I said, that's a guy I want to stay away from. I like that you've got a, a name for. I got. I like that you got a name for the fault. That's kind of. That's kind of funny. I like that. It's the most clever thing G Man has to his name. It's. It's. Uh. It is catchy, G Man. Did you make that up? Did you steal that from somebody? No. 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 He literally calls his audience the dragoons, and they're drama, and and, and they're like a drama community that wants to. We well, before we go life. too far, just uh, I know that you guys have a history. I don't want to yeah. have them uh, represented in a negative light when they're not here to defend themselves. Right, we right. we get in, we got in trouble with that once in a while, but I do know now. Here, think about this. If I understand mm-hmm. right, the word on the streets, the streets of YouTube, is that you and Steve McRae have a common, you might say, enemy. What if you and Steve McRae teamed up against drag? And Erica. And what topic? Whatever you want, G Man. This is your world. We're all just squirrels trying to get a nut. Okay. Uh, first of all, if Drag's gonna gonna be on Erica's side, the answer is no. So, uh, and then I might not be so nice because um, no, no. Oh God, there's a lot of problems with that. Oh no, my no, gosh, no. G Man. I will not be nice next time. No, 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 no. James, I don't appreciate you trying to ruin me and G Man's friendship. It just formed. That's funny. That's so true. John Good is coming at you, though. He says, Erica thinks she is so smart. Ooh, sassy. Yeah, you know, I've gotten that comment a couple of times. I've, I've been called a couple of names. I, you know, I don't know. I try to be as nice as I can be. I'm not trying to be condescending, but, uh, you know, I'm, I just like talking about what I know about. I mean, you would not be saying that if you put me in a room with a chemist, let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I talk about what I know, and if I come across as smug, I'm really sorry. <laughs> That's funny. I think, I, I think a lot of people are going to find out that Erica is good at evolution, but when we start getting into the Genesis apologetics, I think that would be a little bit different. We, we, never, we never got into it. We never got That's into it. Thing, G-Man. I will be the first person to tell you that I would definitely not know the, the, the depths of Genesis apologetics. I wouldn't, you know, Unless we're talking about the organization Genesis Apologetics, I feel like I know them decently well. But as far as the the, the topic, no, I, I'm not an expert in that. I nor would I claim to be. I try not to make claims. I can't back up. Um, but you know, I guess I just think I'm so smart. You're so. not smug. I've never seen that. But I would say Red Shot Sherwood is coming at you, G Man. He says. G-Man Dragnacht does not call his audience the Dragoons. You made that up. <laughs> Did you make that up, G-Man? Okay, Red Shot Sherwood, he calls his, he calls his uh, followers uh, Dragoons. And Red Shot Sherwood might be a little bit mad at me because he came to my room yesterday when I was doing a hangout. And he was misbehaving and I kicked him out. So that might be why he's a little mad at me. Gotcha. Very intriguing. Next up, thanks so much for that. We appreciate the super chat from... Decepticons Forever says James is the final step in hominid evolution. That's really kind of you. Bless your heart. Okay, that's uh, stupid horror energy strikes again saying, G-Man, if similarity is due to a common designer, how do you explain major differences such as convergence? Uh, Elaborate on what you mean by that. Erica, can you remind us what your convergence is? Um, So so essentially... Actually, I wasn't actually fully listening because I heard it was a question for GM, G-Man. Repeat one more time, James. One more time, James. Is uh okay? So she says, G-Man. If similarity is due to common a common designer, how do you explain major differences such as convergence in evolution? So essentially, there there are a couple of different ways that that could go. Um, but basically, G-Man kind of has to explain the, at least the, the the sort of long and short of it is um why why do we have 
different solutions to the same problem, right? So if there's a common designer, why are there like three different types of, of flight? Like you've got a butterfly wing, which is vastly different from a bat wing, which is vastly different from a bird wing, which is different from a pterosaur wing. So why not just have one solution for flight if, if I'm getting that right? The common designer uh, likes variety, I guess. <laughs> the common designer likes variety. A butterfly has to have a certain type of wing to survive in this environment. A bat has to have a certain type of wing in order to, to in order to uh, to survive in his environment and anything else that flies. It just depends on the type of animal it is, where it is in the world, and, and how it survives in that particular um, environment. Next up. Dapper Dino asks if either of you would be, if you have time to go to an after show, he's willing to host it if one of you are able to make it. Are either of you one, uh, able to make it tonight? I can make it Dapper D, but for, okay. for somewhat brief period, 45 minutes probably. You got it. Gotcha. Thanks I so much. would go to a room with Erica, but I already foresee what's going to happen. Me and Erica kind of have like a mutual respect. Well, I think we got a mutual respect for each other as far as we can and go see whatever but i got a funny feeling because i know how these hangouts go that if i go in there things are going to be brought up that are not true about me and are going to be taken out of context or whatever and eric is going to hear it and gonna go whoa i didn't know that wow i didn't know that you know what i mean and they're going to try to get under my skin and i ain't got time for that if they want to have a serious after show i'll go to that but if they want to clown around and goof off and troll no and you cannot you cannot allow no dragoons in there I can, up. I can vouch for Dapper Dino, G-Man, that if you requested it to be a serious hangout, he could probably make that happen, but it's up to you. I'll go if it's a serious hangout, and I don't want no dragoons there. Next Come up. On. I'll on Twitter. Keep going, James. Caleb, thanks for your super chat, also known as Caleb, says, Erica, why are Eskimos less furry than Americans? Why are Eskimos less furry? Because we all wear clothes. There's no need to, there's no, humans are a unique species and that we have kind of completely thrown natural selection out the window. Um, it's the same reason why when someone says, why do humans get so many diseases? Why are we so sick? And it's because natural selection, and I'm not saying this is a good thing. In fact, I think modern medicine is excellent and you know, fantastic in every way. Um, but, but no one is, there's nothing to sort of weed out sick people, right? Like I would probably be dead before the age of 12 because I had pneumonia when I was 12. Um, but it's the same reason. There's no natural selection. If you wear clothes, there's not going to be a selection for thicker fur. Gotcha. Out. And appreciate faithful, honest, and true. You're right. I missed your super chat. Sorry about that. This came in early. They said raw mat and standing for truth taught Erica real science in all three debates. Oh, Erica, it looks like one of Standing for Truth's boys is in the house. Faithful, Honest, and True shows up on my channel quite frequently and, and others sort of into who enjoy conventional science YouTube. Um, Faithful, Honest, and True, anytime you want to have a, I'm still waiting on that email. You only, you only seem to want to have conversations on my channel, which I don't check as comments on my channel, which I don't check as much as I probably should. Um, but I would love to have a chat with you. I'm always open for that. Gotcha. Thanks so much for your super chat from Jack Attack LP. Says, truly Christ-like patience from Erica. And hi, James. Appreciate that. They uh, they I think you're... That was towards me, right? Huh? I guess that was towards me, right? No. They meant, like, patient toward me because I'm always, you know... <laughs> okay. Sidra Zarabi, thanks for your super Whoa. chat. No, G-Man, you were loved. You have no idea how much you are loved. Oh, yeah. I'm so loved on YouTube. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Sigibredo Saravia. But one thing I, I do love, G-Man, you have no idea how much I love, is that I appreciate so much that you will come and actually take a stance because some people are like, they get into a debate and they get blown over because they, they just don't have confidence or they don't, they aren't assertive enough or among many other things where it's just like, Oh my gosh, this is, they're like, uh, they're just getting blown over by the wind. So we appreciate that. You have passion G man among many other positive qualities. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're James, welcome. A hyper compliment. How come I never get any of this? <laughs> She's well, right. They're, in our chat, they're saying that you beat Hoven. I don't think that happened, but, but they, they're saying you beat Hoven, you beat standing for truth, you beat me. Of course, they're free to their opinions, but but reality is a different story. So <laughs> that's really I mean, interesting. I don't take it personally, man. What they need to do is go sub to your channel. That's what they need to do. 
Oh, that's very sweet of you. Go sub to G-Man's channel as well. I, although there I, you are. I'm, <laughs> yeah, everyone here. <laughs> they're all, all they're all already subbed. You're right. That was that was a silly thing to say. I yeah, I I don't think I mentioned. So sorry, folks. I have linked both of our speakers in the description box. Their links are waiting for you. So if you've enjoyed what you've heard, there is plenty more right down there conveniently in that description box. And thanks so much for your super chat from Sigifredo Sarabia in the house. Glad to see you. Says, Erica, are transition animals like humans hybrids? Uh, I think they mean... I, I, I think I know what they're saying. Probably not. Um, the, I mean, the thing is, is that as far as divergence time versus speciation time, you know, one is obviously far before the other. The divergence of the species doesn't mean that, that those two are reproductively isolated necessarily. So while there might be some strange hybrids in our family tree, you know, on an individual level, um, sort of, sort of on the aspect. If you're referring to a hybrid as like a like a liger or something like that, then no, <laughs> probably not. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Appreciate your super chat. Or they also asked, how did we learn they survived when a donkey or liger is sterile today? Uh, and I think they're saying like, how did we learn that animals that were transitions survived when I think they're kind of implying yeah. that donkeys and ligers are transitions and they're sterile. I, I think more what they're implying is potentially that transitional species are sterile sort of isolated anomalies, right? Um, and my answer to that would be the fact that a great many of the hominins that, that we use to bolster human evolution aren't single specimens is sort of one, one example. Um, that they're one rather reason as to why they're likely not hybrids. And when I say likely, I mean incredibly likely not to be. Uh, the odds too that you're going to get to, like say with a liger or a mule, like we, we don't get ligers in the wild because it's quite rare for their, for their habitats to cross. Um, and also when species have a very recent divergence time, the offspring isn't always sterile. So you, you have a couple of things that are making that a very unlikely possibility. Um, I would say that's probably why it's not even considered because this the statistic probability that the fossil record is made up entirely of hybrids um very close to impossible i would say gotcha thanks so much next up appreciate your super chat from let's see sigifredo did ask also why are limitation why are there limitations in evolution is is that for me yeah um, well, I mean, it depends on what limitations they mean. I mean, sometimes people, I, I guess it's sort of the, in reference to, sometimes Kent Hoban likes to say, you know, could you ever get uh, a dog as big as Texas? Well, you're not going to get a dog as big as Texas because there's no ecosystem that supports something that large. Usually, usually limits to evolution are placed on, are placed on an organism, right, or a species rather, by its environment. Um, or by its own morphology. So you could never successfully breed like Great Dane after Great Dane until so you got something as tall as say an elephant because its morphology wouldn't allow for its spindly little legs to hold that kind of weight. Um, so what you would need to do is you would need to select, right, either artificially or in nature, this is natural selection, um, for, for sort of something that would prepare it for that. Like the relatives of elephants are very stocky and stout with thick limbs. So they, they were capable of getting quite large without breaking under their own weight. Really interesting. Yep. And want to say, I'm putting the after show link. So after show, and this will be on Dapper Dino's channel. I'm putting it in the description box right now. So if anybody would like to go check it out, it is conveniently located below. And then G-Man is invited. They said, G-Man, you're invited. And they said uh, that they'd be friendly, something to that effect. Where is this? Something yeah, to that effect. They said, this is the after show link if you could forward it to G-Man. So I can send that to you if you'd like. I'll send it to both of you after. And thanks so much for Decepticons Forever, your super chat, where they said, the Neanderthal wears no clothes. G-Man 2020. <laughs> David, I'm, go ahead. I'm sure that should be your your campaign like slogan. If you ever run for anything, G-Man. No, no one will get it, but I'll get it. All right, cool. <laughs> G Man is not amused. All right, David Belda. Like, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I don't get the joke, but it's all right. <laughs> thanks for I your think... super. Go ahead. Uh, D David Bellock, thanks for your super chat. They said, "How are sapiens and Neanderthals different species if they produced fertile offspring?" 
Ooh, that one's for me. That's an excellent question. And the answer is species is a very, very hard term to define. Um, because for instance, sometimes like, for instance, we, 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 would, we would consider donkeys and horses, right? Completely separate species. And for the most part, when they, when they hybridize, you get infertile offspring. But occasionally when you have a female, I think it's a female horse and a male donkey, you, you can get something that, that is not sterile. Um, so does that still make them separate species? Well, of course it does. Um, they're, they're genetically vastly different from one another, um, even on sort of, sort of a, a, a small scale level. Um, but I would point to the fact that we've sequenced the Neanderthal genome. And while me and the human on this planet, who's the most different from me genetically, if we compared our genome side by side, we would still be about 99.9% .9 similar. However, when you sequence a Neanderthal's genome, at least the five or six of the ones that we've done, um, they're only 99.7% similar to the average human, uh, which kind of separates them. Now, whether or not it's on a species or a subspecies level is still up for debate, because you're absolutely right, we could produce fertile offspring. But I think they're genetically unique enough and also geographically isolated for the vast majority of their species sort of uh, lifespan um, that, that it, it's justification for, for sort of separation from humans on a level. Whether or not it's species or subspecies, I wouldn't say. Um, but yeah, that's my best answer to the question. It's it's a hot topic right now in, in anthropology. Gotcha. Appreciate it. Next up, Super Chat from Caleb or Caleb. Thanks. They said, Erica, why do you why do African lions have such thick fur? I'm assuming they're probably referring to males, and it would be the same reason that male peacocks are so, they look so like flamboyantly colorful, right? Um, you would think that would be a negative because obviously it makes them very easy to be spotted by predators, but there's one thing that trumps uh, sort of physical fitness when it comes to overall fitness for, for a given species. And that's attractiveness to the other species, it's sexual selection. So females prefer peacocks that look like that. So they mate more with those ones. So the colorful ones get to reproduce more often. It's very similar with lions. And for whatever reason, females very much prefer uh, maned males to non-maned males. And it might be because it's symbol area, it's sort of significant of like their overall health because a male lion without a mane would look somewhat sickly um, according to some female lions, I suppose. Um, but yeah, overall it's a burden. Having that huge mane makes them much slower than their female counterparts, even though they are more powerful because they're larger. I would say sexual selection is to blame for most of the bad, uh, bad hands that males get across the animal kingdom. Got Sorry, you. boys. Super interesting. And thanks so much, Godless Recovery. You says just sending this to say thank you, James. That's kind of you. Appreciate that. They said you offer a great platform here. Fark the haters. You rock. Appreciate that very much. They also said also Erica has saintly patience. That's very sweet of them. They must mean, again, you're patient with me. I appreciate that. Alan Dupree, thanks for your super chat. They said, and G-Man's not convinced. They said, G-Man, define, quote, dogma. Dogma? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, the definition of dogma is uh, people who watch Modern Day Debate who give super chats and smile all the time. That's the definition of dogma. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really fast, I got I got a message back from Dapper Dinosaur on Twitter. He promises a serious chat. So if you do want to come, he's telling me it's gonna he's gonna he's gonna mod it up. Right, shoot me a link. I'll look at it and, and see what you want. Maybe maybe drop in, see if you have a good time. You know, whatever. We're okay. all quarantined, G man. It's not like you have anywhere else to go. Come on. No, that's not necessarily true. I guess I gotta unpack and I got things here. I gotta do. I, I can show you this room here alone. Busy man, yeah, people. I, I got a lot of work I gotta do. Leave him alone, people. Okay. Next up, thanks so much. <laughs> I'm teasing you, G-Man. I love you, buddy. Said, uh, let's see. Sister Pharaoh's Rabia in the house still says, Erica, what is the survival benefit of reproducing sexually? Did asexual reproduction end? And what was the first organism to do so? What did that mate with? So the first org to become sexual rather than asexual. Sure. So as far as the first organism, again, you know, I got to say, I'm, I'm not trying to talk on areas that aren't my field. I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know what the first sexually reproducing organism was. I would wager, even if it's represented in the fossil record, which it very well might be because we have some great microfossils out there. Um, it's probably not going to be the first one. Likely the, the, the first, the emergence would have been prior because typically the fossil record gives us a good range, but not necessarily the, the precision of 
exactly when a species emerged because it always could have emerged earlier and then not fossilized. As for the benefit of, of sexual reproduction over asexual reproduction, it's all about genetic diversity. Um, the, the more genetic diversity that you can sort of add into a population, the greater the chances are that, that there's going to be flexibility if a change in the environment comes, right? So if you have like three dogs and they all have a different length of coat, you know, one is naked basically, one has medium length and one has long length, if all of a sudden there's a really bad winter, we well, are probably going to see, you know, the survival of, of the, the hairiest, the, the warmest dog, dog's offspring um, dominate the next generation. So, and that's because of sexual selection, or so rather, sorry, sexual reproduction. Um, plants that reproduce asexually, um, when, when they do so, I, I'm fair, I, I might be able to dig this paper up for you, but I might not, because again, botany is not necessarily my specialty. But when plants reproduce asexually because a partner isn't around, they tend to have a lower fitness over the, as, a, as a population, right, over the next generation than if they were capable of reproducing sexually. Because again, it's genetic diversity. There's more to pick and choose from. I hope that made sense. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And next up, super chat from Don Fullman. Appreciate it. They said, G-Man, are you skeptical or cynical about evolution? Skeptical. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Mike Billers, thanks for your super chat. Who said, G-Man, do you seriously believe you came from dirt? Um, I believe that I came from dirt, and I believe that that's a lot more reason that that's a lot more reasonable uh, than believing that um, I evolved from a watermelon or I share a common ancestor with a watermelon. Thanks so much, John. Good, appreciate your super chat. Who said, Erica, how many assumptions until it's ridiculous? I think that they're a critic of you. This is the same person who was uh, coming down on you earlier, Erica. Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know what assumptions are being made. Um, typically, I mean, if you're looking at it from a, a long time standpoint, right, well, you've got radiometric dating, which is a firm law in physics to back that up. We don't see violations to that. And even creationists have admitted that the rate team was sort of garnered by answers in Genesis, one of the biggest names in the game when it comes to, to creationism. And even they had to admit that exotic solutions have to be proposed for accelerated decay. Um, if you're looking at evolution on, on sort of a, a species by species spectrum, as far as assumptions go, um, well, we're dealing with a very, very, very large span of time. Um, it, it might seem very difficult when, you know, I see creationists prop up certain numbers of improbability for life to form in, in an abiogenetic genetic sort of uh, space, you know, 10 to the 40th, something like that. But the yeah. thing is, the thing that you have to remember, right, is that, sorry, James, I'm almost done, is that you've got millions, if not billions of trials going on simultaneously, as large as the population is, evolution and selection are taking place if that makes any sense it's you know you're 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 having a very large sample size over a long period of time so certain changes are, are dare i say it inevitable gotcha appreciate that and next up appreciate your super chat from let's see sentinel apologetics who says g man please read genesis 120 why do birds come from the waters and ask erica to clarify how the cambrian era evolves to ev avian evolution and what we will do is okay so i think that that's supposed to be a hint to g man so they say g, g man please read genesis 120 why do birds come from the water uh this is my this is going to be my response for that um I'll do that when they prove to me they read the Bible. That's when I'll do it. Because my experience, and I'm not talking about you, Erica, all right? This is for the audience that's trolling me all day. My experience is people that are asking me these questions haven't even picked the book up and read it. So just saying. Gotcha. Next up, appreciate your sweet. Not directly to the audience. <laughs> you got it. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Next up. Appreciate your super chat from Stupid Horror Energy, who says, Rob, birds evolved from dinosaurs, not from water. So she's saying that to Sentinel Apologetics, namely that birds evolved from dinosaurs, not from water. Then Sidra Fredo Sarabia, thanks for your super chat, who said, Erica, if evolution has so many predictions, what is the next animal outside bird, mammal, reptile, bird, or insect? Uh, I think they're saying, like, what's the next new species going to come from? Mammals? or birds, or reptiles, or insects, isn't every minute millions of years past? Well, I feel like that's kind of a, there's a bunch of different ways you could take that question. I mean, if they're asking what the next group is going to be, because we currently have, you know, reptiles and mammals and birds and fish and insects, etc. 
um, and amphibians, I would say it's whatever it is, I, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's going to be a, a further categorization of an existing group, right? Because mammals, right, are still tetrapods, you know, and tetrapods are obviously still eukaryotes. So you don't necessarily see a group of things turning into another group of things or a kind becoming another kind. Uh, what you see is, is further specialization. That's what a nested hierarchy is. Um, I, I have a lot of, I love speculative evolution. I think a lot of it is just for fun though. I'm not sure that you could um, make predictions, particularly because we don't necessarily know how the climate's going to change. When, evolu when evolutionary biologists make predictions about the past, we do it knowing what change occurred, right? Like that's how we knew where Tiktaalik was because we knew what that ancient environment looked like. And we knew what to expect if we were assuming that we have a, a sarcopterygian fish turning into a tetrapod or rather having descendants that would then uh, produce tetrapods, right? So that's, that's how that prediction works. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make predictions in the future because we don't have enough data to do that. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. We got a super chat from Eric Veerthaler, 92, says, does G-Men believe in biblical flat earth? I can tell you from earlier, he does not. John Good, thanks for your super chat, said, so fish, in all caps, took a walk on land and now we're here. LOL. Yes. Well, well, I'll say this in regard to the flat earth thing, uh, 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 James, um, that while I don't believe in flat earth, I, I do believe one particular thing that they say. I don't believe that we ever, uh, this is when I'm going to get some criticism from America and a lot of other people. I said this before, this is going to be your first time hearing me say this. I don't know about, I don't know if we've ever left um, earth and actually went to the moon. And I'm only saying that, not because of what a flat earther said to me, but because of what I heard NASA actually say. How are you going to tell everybody you lost all of the information or you destroyed the information on how to get to the moon? That's very suspicious. And then there's the issue of the atmosphere, how hot everything gets when we go out into the atmosphere. There's some things we can talk about in, in, in the future regarding that, but that's where I stand with that. I am not a flat earther, though. I believe they're around. Gotcha. Appreciate it. Next up, super chat from Padme the Cat, who says, time to ask the real question. And I'm sorry, James, I don't want to make things tense, but G-Man, why hasn't your roommate G-Cat paid me back my $5? Oh, you know, I, I don't know. G-Cat can't really talk, and he can't really hear all that well, but uh, uh, G-Cat's all the way in the other room, and I would get him and like you know, put him on camera and let you see him and everything, get your money and everything. But tell you what, if you give me your super chat, your super chat information i will send you a feline five dollars as soon as possible and just make the cat pay me back later how about that very nice chez elliot thanks for your super chat who says erica the elucidator that is very sweet it is. <laughs> thank you i i appreciate that i i, I always i you know i'm glad i use such harsh lighting so no one can see me blush <laughs> uh, elucidator what is that what's an elucidator she makes uh, things clear yeah P it's, it's oh, okay. All right. I have a question for the audience, and I would like for them to get back to me. I want to know how many of them, and Erica, this is one thing that's going to be a little bit tense. How many of you actually believe Erica answered the question regarding Amazon's features? Because that's when we started getting like a little, like, like I want them to start talking about that. I know that they're ignoring that, and they didn't really talk about that too much. No, I'm, I'm okay with it, G-Man. By all means, pull the audience. I, I would love to know if, if they think that I, that I did that. Yeah, I would love to hear it too, and I like to know how because I'm going to hold you accountable later when I Please find do. out who you are on YouTube, buddy. Thank you. Gotcha. Appreciate your super chat from P Barnes, who says Erica equals patience and true class. Got a lot of fans out there, Erica. They're, they're too kind to me, honestly. I, I just like to come on and, and have discussions and have a good time. I Like I said to G Men before, it's, I'm a hard person to rile up. <laughs> Very nice. Josiah Hansen, appreciate your super chat, who says, woohoo, it's Erica. Also, no G-Cat, boo. Very yeah, sad. I've never met G-Cat. G-Cat's in there sleeping like I'm going to be doing soon. <laughs> Next up, John Rapp, right. thanks for your super chat. They said, uh, to John Good, pretty much, yes, get over it. Um, oh, okay, so that was in response to the one that asked about, so fish came onto land and then now we're here. And then Eric Veerthaler92, Thaler appreciate your super chat, who said, oh, we already asked that one. That's embarrassing. I think they like Just, you, Erica, because, because of how clear you are at articulating what evolution is. I think that's why they like you. But, but, but what I'm going to do later on when I go on my channel 
is I'm going to be asking them, okay, great. She's very articulate, uh, articulate at, at explaining her position. Now let's talk about whether or not evolution is true. Hey, be careful, man. I make a mean response video. That's what I'm going oh, <laughs> You know what? You can make a great video response. Listen, I haven't had a, a video war with somebody in a long time. So by all, oh, actually, I do it every day, my man. So <laughs> no problem. Don't worry about it. Listen, I got nothing but time. I'm cooped up in my house. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Cool. A mean video response. Subscribe to GTV. I'm gonna and I, I'm already sub to you. So yes, will do. I will go sub to GTV now. Great. Gotcha. And appreciate your super chat from. Let's see. We have uh, Decepticons oh, forever. You, wait, wait, wait a I got to Erica something before you go over there. So I was not happy about the scholar fiction behavior on this channel. So I kind of like was going off and I ranted and I mentioned you a couple of times. Like, Erica, better not cheat, better not cheat. Just ignore that video. All right, thank you. Gotcha. Appreciate I, that. I hope I hope I was at least um I hope I met the expectations with that. I hope I didn't do any of the things that I better not do. No, I believe you're probably the most respectful evolutionist I've talked to one here in the smartest one. And I want to have more conversations with you. Thank uh, you. Versus some of these other people in here that, that don't know how to count to three. You know what I mean? So I definitely respect you for that. Definitely. Gotcha. And appreciate your super chat from Superdor Energy, who says James invited me <laughs> uh, to join him and open his robe. <laughs> you are insane. Uh, Stupidor Energy also says, <laughs> I just, the, the funny idea is like somebody opening their robe. That's just, it never happens today uh, that I know of. Uh, Stupid horror Energy. Uh, appreciate uh, your other one who said, G-Man, how did you wash yourself when you were at the house in Pennsylvania? Uh, let me see something here. Uh, <laughs> I have a feeling uh, this is a troll chat. I answered. <laughs> Next up. Appreciate your super chat from Sentinel Apologetics who says, James, I'll debate all flat earth people. My scotch is ready. Sentinel Apologetics, if you're serious about that, we might be able to arrange it. Z Leaping Bear, thanks for your super chat, who said, any Christians who were there watching the creation or the handling, the handing down of the commandments or of Jesus or any of that, can they prove it? No. Oh, okay, I love the response to that. I don't know. I, I, I think Erica's going to agree with me on this. That's kind of unfair. Things. Yeah, that, 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 that's kind of unfair considering you wasn't there when the single cell became a multi-cell and, you know, became a fish-like creature and all the other claims that you guys make about your evolutionary. You, you wasn't there for the macro stuff. So, uh, so be there. You know what I mean? No, I wasn't there, and I take a faith-based position, but you wasn't there when the single cell, you know, supposedly came from nothing. You know what I mean? And then... Um, and then uh, apparently became a multi-cell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, nah. Very sassy. Next up, appreciate your <laughs> super chat. Might be unfair like that. Or like, well, what do you think about that? I wasn't there when Jesus did all those things. But they wasn't there when the single cell became a multi-cell. Are, are you asking me, G-Man? Yeah, like, 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 what's your opinion on a comment like that? I, I think, I mean, I get I get what they're going for. I think the difference, if, if you and I were to have this conversation, my my... Like if you were to say, well, you weren't there for any of your things, because um, I made a little pun about it. R.J. Uh, Downer and Jackson Weed have covered this. They they kind of say it playfully. Their their book is titled "The Rocks Were There." So I would respond by saying, I think the differences and and no shade on on faith. Like I think it, saying that it's faith is clarifying your position. It's not like you're saying that it's not. I think it's a bit different with with sort of geology and evolutionary theory because while yes, no one is there directly observing it. It's kind of like why I mentioned, you know, like a, a black hole, like ob observing stellar bodies, even though we can't directly see them. Um, we still, it's still legitimate science, right? Because you're getting data points from it and whether or not it's indirect doesn't sort of throw shade on whether or not it's legitimate, right? Like doctors do the same thing. They, they're not directly culturing every, you know, pathogen, assuming it's bacteria uh, that, that they have and every patient they come in, they look at the symptoms and they say, well, the data, the symptoms look like it's probably pneumonia. So we're bacterial. So we're going to prescribe antibiotics. You know what I mean? So I think it's a little bit different, but I do get what you're saying. It, de it depends on the definition of faith, though, because a lot of people think when you hear the word faith, it's a claim without the proof. Uh, the, the, the faith that Christians hold to is faith backed with evidence. Sure. See, a lot of people believe that. I believe a lot of things in the book of Genesis, like the flood, and I have no proof for it. That's ridiculous. I have a ton of proof for the, for, for the, for the global flood. Proof that Adam and Eve were actually real people. I got proof for these things. You know what I mean? It's just because I wasn't physically there to be to, to see it myself. I can't necessarily say like it's like 
you know what I mean? I have to say that 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 is still a faith at the end of the day. I would I would wager that that the person that you're talking to, if you could provide provide like indirect evidence or proof for the claims that you just made, I would I would hope I would wager and I would hope that they would be that they would find that sufficient. Uh, but I don't know that for sure. So it depends because a lot of us we come into these conversations with a bias, you know what I mean? And and we'll hold on to the bias instead of actually looking at the information for what it is. Like I said, me and you never really got into it. I really, really, really wish we would have gotten to Genesis. Well, gee man, where's your proof? I would have gave you your proof. I wouldn't have, please. When it comes to and listen to me, I'm not the best in the world when it comes to science, but when it comes to this, I ain't no joke. So and they know it. So <laughs> when it comes to this, I can break this down. So Hey man, I would I would love to be the person to have that conversation with you, but I gotta defer to to someone who knows the topic a little better, you know, because I I will be the, again I'll be the first one to admit I would not hold a candle because I haven't studied it, you know. Right, I got gotcha. you. I understand. Gotcha. Yeah. Next up, appreciate your super chat. Stupid whore energy who says, G-Man, did you notice you are more similar to your brother, less similar than your cousin, even less similar to a stranger? The same logic applies to chimps. Why do you suddenly reject that logic? Well, uh, th that logic is kind of weird because I'm similar to just about every human being on the planet. Uh, there, there are not a whole lot of differences between myself and other human beings on this planet including females, okay? But when we're talking about the, 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 what is it, chimps, he said? Chimps, like, really, chimps? No, no, I'm sorry. And then, and, and like I said, this is the topic I wish we would've got into. There's a lot of differences between myself and the chimp. And I jokingly, in my opening statement, stated that if, that if you really felt that way, then maybe we should open up zoos for humans and throw them in there. There's a lot of differences between myself and, uh, and chimps. But again, we never really got into it, got into it, you know? Gotcha. I, I get that. Hey, James, real fast, because um, I'm chatting with Dapper Dinosaur on uh, on Twitter. He says that he doesn't have a way to get G-Man the invite link uh, and asks that you... No, it's all right. I'm kind of tired. Uh, uh, these questions are like, if you want to host a show on your YouTube channel, you know what I mean? You'll get a... If, if you advertise it, I guarantee you there's a lot of people that's going to watch it. But if you do a, a, a live show and you just want to just do me and you and we can talk about the fossil record, we can do that. But get your patience up first. Because like I got that. I'm a pain in the butt. I'm I'll, I'll openly admit it. Listen, G man, again, if I can if I can handle you once, I you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to go again. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about these chats. That's what I love to do. I love talking about this stuff. You nice. say that now. I've had a lot of people say that to me. A lot of people blew their top, so I don't know. <laughs> we haven't talked about nothing in this entire debate. You'd be shocked, I'm telling you. All right. Okay. I, I'm willing to take that challenge. Next up mike billers thanks for your super chat mike said thanks g-man erica and james when i saw this debate was scheduled i was stoked <laughs> stoked to hear that thanks so much mike and all credit to the speakers for a long time i said I'm, I'm gonna debate erica one day most people be like oh you know she's scared no, 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 no. I, I run to these things i run to them <laughs> that's Harry. right we've missed you g-man it was like a couple months since we've we've seen you Wow, I'm flattered. I've I've never been called. I've been called a lot of things. Scary is not one of them, but I'm I'm flattered. Mm. Next. I'm not scared yet. I'll debate you any day of the week, and I I definitely want to do the thing on the fossils. Please. I don't know about tonight because I'm honestly tired, and these questions that they're asking is exhausting. So. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> you got be. it. Next up, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Erica. No, that was it. That was it. Go ahead. Stupid Aura Energy. Thanks for your other super chat who said, Peacocks show for days and even get sickly. I have a video of that. Okay. Stupid Aura Energy also says, thanks for your super chat. She says, G-Man, do you understand that two proteins don't need to have the same amino acids to perform the same function? Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Next up. Yeah. <laughs> Doubting Thomas, thanks for your super chat, who says, G-Man, how hot is it outside of the atmosphere? Yeah! <laughs> I'm tired, James. I want to get out of here. That was the last one. So we appreciate yeah. everybody's questions. It's always fun, folks. want to remind you, we are definitely appreciate our guests, and we want to let you know, I have linked both of them in the description. Their links are waiting for you just down in that little box down there, see? And I want to say thanks so much, though, Erica and G-Man for being with us. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. Had, had a blast as always. I'll, I will I will show up in the comments uh, here shortly, hopefully. Probably It'll probably be a little bit later, though, because I think I'm, I'm going on Dapper's channel. But 
I will get I will get those sources to you guys, people. I've, I've I have uh, this word I'm looking for. I've come through on the past in that. I went full G, man. You guys owe me. I don't want to hear it later. You guys owe me later. Okay, <laughs> you owe me. <laughs> full G. Next up, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. And thanks so much, everybody, for hanging out. It's always just a fun time. It really does put me in a great mood. I enjoy just being here. And your questions, everything else, uh, you guys really make this a blast. So we are excited, as you uh, have may or may not have noticed, we will be here with future debates. So hopefully we'll see you for those. Otherwise, we will be a take care, stay healthy and well, and have a great rest of your night.